<laughs> All right, I believe we are live. Welcome everybody to the most controversial stream on the internet, the left stream. <laughs> I did not intend to be so, but it turns out every time we are on here, the subjects we end up talking about. This is supposed yeah. to be a nice, peaceful, quiet stream where I get to work on my beautiful NFT called Muscles. And as you could see, it's been uh, going through a lot of changes recently. We have the clouds from last time, but now we also have this guy over here who I call uh, Deer Man. And, uh, Gio, what do you think of Deer Man? Deer Man? I think that's great. I think that's, like, that one scene, um, it's got some kind of, like, Norse mythology going on. And he's got a tail as well, who has the, uh, antlers just like he does, and it's looking very upset at, uh, whatever's going on. And also there's this nice slime puddle, for, and the slime is emanating from, uh, the tongue of this guy over here and I even have a little I even have a little mouse man over here with uh with the uh ears with mouths and eyes on it so it, you know the, the 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 very detail intensive nfts you make I really dig because they remind me of like Richard Scarry books I'm probably mispronouncing his last name but like um uh, uh, uh S C A R R Y like he would have like so much detail in every page that you could never see it all on the first glance Mm. So, so I'm always yeah. reminded of that when you work on um, the the very detail intensive NFTs. Oh, and thank and you. Alexandra, what are you working on? Oh my God! In her headphones. And again, again oh with the God. headphones. In We're fact, she, she she's probably she probably has like a cardboard cutout of me because I spoke ill of good jewels. So now she's like shadow boxing and practicing how to like one two jab, one two jab on like my fat masked queen's ass. So. Exactly. Oh, oh, and we also have Hotep Sophia in the house, and uh, hey, she's going to be talking. She's going to be talking about something very, uh, very important. Something oh, having to God. do with the breaking of a uh, of the bucks, I believe. Uh, and I'm sure that's what I is, heard. That I'm this is why. About. And this is why I think it's very appropriate, Hotep Sophia, that for this stream I have this deer over here because it's like a buck in a way, right? It's like a, a male deer. Close. It's got Close. it's got the, the antlers. Like that. Yes. That's on the deer dance. Ho Hotep Sophia, bienvenido. Uh, um, and we, we're 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 eager to hear. Uh, what the deal is on what has been leading to so much grumbling on the internet. All these uh, shit-flinging, everyone getting angry, everyone... You know what? Even people writing four-page essays yeah. before blocking the guy that, that it's meant for. And all that, all that, all that crank to 11. So thank oh, wait, you for coming we, on by. Oh, and on. of course we got a safety propaganda. Adam Lehrer in the house oh, as well. Welcome, Adam. There. Hello. Uh, Geo. It is oh. great to be back. And I'm doing a wood engraving because we have about three members of the tribe in this chat. <laughs> I'm doing a wood engraving of uh, I this this but this one is uh, one of my favorite depictions of Christ on the cross was from Titian, uh, which is a relatively simple painting from his line of work. But this is just basically like a cutout of if you could see, can you see that? Yeah, it's mm. basically like a cutout of like. His original work, and at the bottom, I believe he has um, Mary and Saint Peter. Now, what is the uh, pillow that you have over there, Gio? Oh, this what is, is this? This is called a sandbag. This is um, a very old, um, a very like old um, original metal engraving and jewelry um, device, where it's basically just a leather bag with sand, and it like literally will hold um, either the wood piece or the metal plate in place, and you could like turn it, manipulate it. Um, some people use like the modern like clamp system, but me, I just find this like more like Lindy and like open ended. So when I do a bit more of metal plate engraving as well, I will use the sandbag because you literally just like hold the burn like this. And by the way, I have my like new burn set that caught, you know, Ooh. I had to fucking, yeah. I had to beat this. Wait, let me... Alexandra got pretty excited when she I saw beat... that. I beat this guy's brains out on eBay to get them uh, at the last minute. Um, but no, so basically you manipulate um, the, the either the metal or copper or like this is end grain cherry, which is That's like, great stuff. Yeah. Um, and then you just go. Um, I, I personally love cherry because um, like, I mean, maple is good too, like rock maple. 
for like wood engraving, but I tend to notice it's a bit lighter. Um, but I mean, the real stuff they use in England and France was uh, boxwood, but that's like impossible to get here without like costing an arm and leg. But like, in, but in North America and Canada, we have an abundance of rock maple and like ironwood and things like that. Um, but and, this one. And by, by the way, if we mix two of the things you said so far today, you use the word Lindy and you use the word England. Lindy England. You remember her? Oh yeah, it wasn't she. Uh... Oh, uh, she was one of the uh, the torturers at the. Uh, uh, oh Abugari. yeah, that's right. That's right. Wonder where she's up to. Could we get her on the show? Oh God. So uh, let's <laughs> be- let's begin here. Um, the very like long. I'm basically like l- looking through a jeweler's loop for like two hours straight. So, um, so what were you going to talk about left buck breaking or are we going to just, uh, yeah, well, just first let's talk. Yeah. Let's get straight into bug breaking. But first I wanted to ask why the, um, the, why the censorship around this topic? There was this YouTuber that you mentioned that did a whole video about it and, uh, got into some uh, trouble on YouTube or on Twitter? Like, what exactly happened to you? Um, OKI is a very popular, like, um, like weird, obscure stories YouTuber. And he's he does great work. I mean, he's, like, you know, I don't think he's, like, that much of, a, like, a political person, but he, like, just basically was going after the fact that, um, like, Tariq Nishida's, like, put out, like, literally, like, one of the most homophobic things ever. And he got, like, censored because I think Tariq Nasheed, like, just sends out an army of people to, like, uh, go after the, uh, the, the, the... And this, and, and OKI is a black man himself, so I guess he's, like, he was the one that got braked, like, his... Okay, wait, got... wait, start this, wait, start this story over because I missed the first part because I don't even know what the topic is, why this even came up, so I, I know you were just explaining it. Oh, yeah, so... no, well, o- OKI is a YouTuber that uh, was had a live stream about buck breaking and he, he uh, got, <laughs> and Tariq Nasheed basically sent his people out to, uh, you know, do, do the, uh, you know, do the, the thing, you know, the, but, uh, which, do, you know, which YouTuber it was, was it like, yeah. Okay. I stories like he, he uh, does okay, a lot of videos stories. of like obscure, mm. like, um, Jesus. he did this one series, which was fascinating where this like, like old school, like royal family in Europe, like one of these old aristocratic families got basically taken in by the scamster that like pretended he was part of like the uh, counter new world order. And he like gave, they like gave him all his, their money and everything. Oh yeah. It was hilarious. Charles and just, Tilly. And he just left. Yeah. And then he just like left and then the oh, man. got him. It was hilarious. Um, but I think, yeah, I think they got him in France though, because he was like, telling them that they were special because they had like the bloodline of Christ or something. And, um, basically they gave him all their money (laughs) and, uh, Oh Jesus. Yeah. Um, so he's done like a lot of stories. Well, the, the, I was going to say about that, the, I mean, that's literally what the rules believe anyway, is that they are the, they are the descendants of Christ, which is what gives them the right to rule over the rest of us normies or whatever, breathers, yeah. eaters, because um, they are the ones who have the special rights and we're the ones who don't. And so uh, that actually makes way more sense than it probably should uh, to me. Cause yeah. that's, but I wouldn't be giving away all my money. That's not, probably uh, not to Not to derail, but I've always been fascinated by how Christ is the is the go to guy goes the guy snaps and then claims he's a religious figure or I'm gonna try to get what's yours into my hand. No one ever goes, I'm the descendant of Buddha, Shiva, Krishna. It's uh, always it, it's always Jesus, and I've always wondered like why that's so. Um in 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 the Asia though, there have been like scamsters that have claimed that they were the descendants of the Gautama Buddha. But I get your point. Yeah, it's true. There was also um, okay, I also did another story where he, um, like, he took the, you know, what's the guy's name, the the scientist, uh, the frogs are freaking gay. Um, <laughs> he took the guy that discovered how, um, basically, atrazine was turning the uh, frog population hermaphetical, 
And uh, he right. actually interviewed him and everything. But the, the, no, but the point, the, the reason it's relevant is because OKI, he uh, was doing a live stream about the, uh, the, the something breaking, uh, you know, um, story. And uh, basically Tariq Nasheed or someone connected to him, like they got wind of it and they like just hounded his, uh, they like, you know, false, false strike. And you know how, you just know how YouTube is so generous and reasonable yeah. with fake copyright strikes. So um, that's yeah. funny. Cause this guy, okay. I came directly up. This is interesting. Um, I've never heard of him. So I'm going to look at some of these videos. But the whole, it, I think that it's it's kind of like all of a sudden, like everybody is just anti-black, which I mean, I can understand why, but <laughs> at the same point, Sorry. I mean, because if you, if you believe the crime statistics, you know, the FBI crime statistics, it does make black people look pretty bad. I mean, there's not a lot we can do to compete against these numbers and the stories coming out of the inner cities and stuff like that. However, I'm not necessarily a believer of the government in general, so it's kind of weird for the people on the alt-universe to be quoting to me government statistics mm -hmm. as if that's supposed yeah, to be they, what there's I a lack believe. Of skepticism. It's weird. It is really weird how people that do pride themselves on how the government like i mean it's probably like i mean i don't want to get into this argument obviously but like um it's probably like there is validity to it but it is funny how there is sort of like a lack of skepticism when it comes to like specifically like going after like you know um a certain demographic in America. confirmation bias obviously mm. no but certain things are easier to uh, observe where it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see like if i saw hotep sophia for instance walking down the street or You'd if go i the saw the other way lev i know you would <laughs> you bastard <laughs> exactly no but it's like if i see somebody walking down the street regardless of what color their skin is whatever if i just see somebody who just looks fucking unstable who looks like somebody who like if i look the wrong way at them they're just gonna charge at me it doesn't take a lot to differentiate somebody like that versus anybody who's in the zoom call right now and it doesn't take a lot for a person to determine that just based on you know certain like whether or not they uh, should uh, just stay calm and uh, everything's gonna be fine or whether they should cross the street I think this kind of stuff is very intuitive and oh. it's not something that requires a lot of uh, ingenuity to understand well, if I, mean, I saw Stain Haynes in an alley I don't know what I would do I <laughs> well you, you guys would reenact one of your favorite uh, wrestling Matches, uh, honestly, Geo, 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 if you, if you, if going you, on. If you, if, you, <laughs> if you saw me in an alleyway, I'd be I'd be expecting a balls count anywhere match to start as soon as we lock the, eyes. The uh, <laughs> the lawn, the, uh, the yeah the um the garage match between Eddie Guerrero and John Cena, which was the only good John Cena match in my opinion. But but just real quickly to build on what Hotep Sophia and Geo were saying, it is a little strange how someone can be like. These FBI crime statistics, I believe in wholeheartedly. And these <laughs> unemployment statistics, I'm going to take with a grain of salt. And it's like, dude, the government lies about shit all the time. And I know that's like a basic, like, lowest common denominator thing to say. But, like, about things that matter to things that don't matter. So, like, it, it ends up becoming this very strange balancing act of, like, this I'm going to believe in wholeheartedly and spam and post it as a reply to every single kind of post I get. But then, you know, hey, the Dow Jones is looking pretty good. That must mean the economy is mm. okay, right? Like, it's, it's such well, a uh, weird selective... Well, like, hold up, Sophia. Like, you could see the people, for example, who are knocking out the, uh, the Asians, like the Chinese people, uh, and you notice that they, they don't have, they don't have their shit together. There's something about, like, the way that they move and the way that they would automatically no. just... No, 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 there's a lot of black on Asian crime, but because nobody is looking at why, like, Asians have historically come into black communities and messed them up really bad with fast food, all this hair stuff, nails, all this consumerism into black communities, which me being an entrepreneurship, a black entrepreneurship historian, that is what black people used to do, our own services in our own community. When mm, Asians yeah. came here, they came into our communities and put us out of business for their businesses. This happened over and over and over again. And they could do this because they were bringing in people, paying them extremely like low amounts, like now 
next to nothing or they had to work their way out or whatever the case may be but they were bringing people in basically slave labor yep. having these people work and they they ran us out of business you can't compete with slave labor so that's what i'm always saying about to to white americans it's not just y'all who it's not blacks against whites it's americans against non-americans because we're all being run out of our jobs like we're but there, but there are different Everybody ways to against, respond to yeah. that. But the person who would respond to that by just like picking some random Asian and knocking them out, that is, you know oh, what well, I mean? My fiancé I mean, I got punched in the face. Really? That's terrible. Well, although right. I, would, I would like to point out... Have fun. Um, Love you. What, what, what Hotep like Shafia... Wait, what? Shafia, wait, what? Shafia, wait, wait hold on. So, somebody said something. Was that you, Adam? So, sorry, guys. My Don't worry about it. Oh, okay, no problem. Some I wish I could. I wish I, I wish I could see all the other people on the stream for some reason again. Oh God, bless you, Windows 10. You love to make these updates that make everything all the all the better, <laughs> don't you? Because uh, uh, now now I went to try to connect my other computer to this one so that we could also have that Zoom screen on the side where I could actually see everybody's uh, faces all at once. And it says over here when I do that, this device doesn't support Miracast, so you can't project to it wirelessly. Oh my god, congratulations, congratulations. Yay, Yay I'm uh, so happy. I'm so I'm so thrilled that Windows is so caring and thoughtful as to prevent me from yeah. I'm, I'm gonna pretend to be surprised when Lev goes, I'll be right back, and he throws something against the wall as far as it comes to Damn the idea. comes back yeah. like nothing happened with the biggest shit eating grin on his face. Um just just real quickly, um Hotep Sophia, uh, it's uh one thing that I've noticed here. In, uh, in New York City, and I've heard about it uh, uh, from friends in other parts of the city uh, and or just the countries that like it's not just Asians. Like, for example, um, it, it's not uncommon for like a Dominican hair salon to open up in a predominantly black neighborhood and from there begins to take uh, the customer and client base of what of, of this predominantly black neighborhood. And uh, yeah, but and I like thought you Dominicans were honorary black people. But, but here, yeah, no, well, no, uh, uh, it's really American blacks that blacks protect. But you're right, that has happened with other nationalities. However, yeah. it was really the Asians that did it first, and the, they still dominate most communities. So if a Dominican opens up a salon, they're really not they're not really serving black customers like that. Meaning they may serve black people, but not black Americans. So I always make the distinction between black Americans and other blacks because I'm always saying that they're just not the same type of people. They're not, they don't come from the same people. They don't have the same shared background. I don't care what Zuby says. It's not true. Like we're not all the same. I am nowhere near oh, like right. a, a Nigerian black. Not I mean, like, close. like, like long story short, my mom's side of the family's from Ecuador. All right. So like, uh, in, in, in all of, in all of Latin America, except like maybe most of Argentina and Chile, like there are Latinos of all colors. Like there are Latinos whiter than Lev and blacker than Wesley Snipes and like every color in between. Mm -hmm. Okay. However, it should be noted that um, Latinos, like Afro-Latinos, they're super quick to draw a line in the sand and go, oh, we're not like them, all right? And then, much like African immigrants who come, like, Lev can attest to this, like, African immigrants who come to New York City, they draw a line in the sand to go, oh, we're not like them either. It's like mm -hmm. this really weird, like, downhill flow of people hating on other people, like, all Latinos hate on Puerto Ricans. Then Puerto Ricans hate on Dominicans because, LOL, you're black. Then I mean, Dominicans look down on Haitians going, LOL, you're the, you're blacker than us. Yeah. Then Haitians look down on African Americans going, hey, at least we're not like them. It's this really ugly, like, downhill mm. Everybody says at least we're not like African Amer yeah, black Americans. Uh, Everybody says that. And it's crazy that I think part of the problem is, like, there are people so like uh, about the violence part let me talk about that first so i think there are a lot of unstable mixed bred black americans and that is where you have a lot of problems because when you just like when you have like the jesse smollett's of the world like when you have a bunch of mixed bred people they behave in ways that can't be um managed really uh just 
uh, was the other guy? Bubba did the same thing with the lying and the stuff. This is this is classically known. Oh, the NASCAR to mix, guy. Yeah, the NASCAR guy. Like it's just, it's classically known in the black community. You got a uh, a mulatto person. They're going to act a little. They're going to be unpredictable. They're just going to be unpre. You don't know which side is going to come out. Wouldn't you say that's kind of like a racial like? In in our uh, post racial world, wouldn't you <laughs> wouldn't you say that um that's sort of like a uh, form of a uh, quote unquote essentialism to say that mixed race people are confused about their identity, for example? I would say that it's true, but it I mean the proof is in the pudding. You can see in the behavior that that there's some sort of you know something going on there, and so with the violence, I think you have a lot of black people in America who have been riled up by this whole BLM thing and they see that there's no consequences for their action and so they're going to be paved in violent in violent ways plus you have a lot of black people with undiagnosed mental conditions well, so you have all of these crazy <laughs> negroes <running>. oh. <laughs> to well, BLM okay, you have a bunch of crazy black folks running the streets and then you're wondering why all this crazy stuff is happening. Like there needs to be more facility. I mean, but this is not just this is for every, all people in America at this well, point. Like there yeah. needs to be more mm-hmm. facilities to put these type well, of people in. There needs to be better well, ways of identifying these people who have these problems and are on these drugs. Because in our own communities, we know who the crazy people are. We like, okay, that one's crazy. Stay away from that one. Okay, that's a bad area. Let's not go there after a certain time. Or when you go, you conduct yourself in a certain way. Or they start acting crazy. You act crazy back at them. They don't know what to do. Like you have well, strategies of dealing go with ahead, people, Adam. but you just yeah. they're crazy. Well, BLM <laughs> BLM specifically does a very spe- like they do a very specific thing. Um, concerning like the political economic structure of how it's formed because they're claiming to represent like the masses but in fact we know at this point that between their financial ties to monopoly capital it's more like an alliance between um like black bourgeoisie and like black petty bourgeoisie and like uh, it's it's less about like abolishing the present political economic order than more like you know finding a slot in it, diversifying it. But you can't keep that going for so long if it, if as it becomes more obvious as Jeff Bezos you know donates all this money to the BLM fund. So what they do is they they use these very sort of like hyper reactionary slogans like abolish the police, like all this shit that doesn't make any sense. Like Sophie said, what they're doing is very specifically trying to appeal to the lumpen proletariat of their own base, so then they can create these like very loud spectacles of grievance by saying, you know, they, they can appeal to like literally, it's more like, it's actually like an alliance between um, like a more elite economic base and like actually like a criminal lumpen proletariat base. And that's why it's been what's a lumpen for so proletariat just so lumpen like proletariat useless, uh... yeah they're like they're like uh working class people that that don't well so um, this actually has historical uh things too i'm finding out because um if you even look at if you I'll, let me just do the march on washington even if you look at the march on washington the reason it was chosen to be done in the first place is that you had a philip randolph and these pullman car people like deciding that they really wanted to make as big a spectacle as possible so that they could get this voting rights act passed which we know the voting rights act has nothing to do with black people like it's and this is the same thing and so even further back in history around the turn of the century there were a lot of um 1900s there were a lot of secret organizations in the well across the world but particularly in the black community and what the secret organizations would do, they made money from selling life insurance. And so what they would do is they would make a big spectacle of going and paying their life insurance dues. And basically, if you lived in that community, you had to pay dues to these 
secret societies. And a lot of them, they didn't have to have charters. They didn't have to keep money. They didn't have mm. to keep records. They didn't have to do anything. Is, but, is, this by, is this by any chance related to Prince Hall Freemasonry, or is that different? Yes, it's, but they're, the black ones were um, the Odd Fellows. Uh, and the uh, Prince Hall, Prince Hall, Prince I Hall's one, yeah. but and then there were some other ones. But the Odd Fellows is the one that I've I've read something about, and this is like a un, you know basically told part of history because you know this is this is what they did. They made people line up and go through the town. I mean, this was a time there wasn't cell phones. I mean, there wasn't you know communication like that. The only way they could prove that they were who they said they were is by having all their members literally parade through town to pay their dues and they would do this and if there were more than one secret society in your town you had to you literally had to get life insurance from more than one secret society so you <laughs> could have all these different life insurances they could never pay out because a lot of them just didn't pay out because this is how they made money it was i mean the whole thing is like basically what blm has done and because no one knows history they don't understand that they've taken all of these tactics that they've been percolating through the black community since emancipation, essentially, it's definitely since reconstruction, but all these different ideas and different tactics, they've been percolating around the black community. They've taken them and they've done them all at once. All at once, that's what be able, they're doing every technique they have all at once, which is why I know for a fact it can be very successful because if you have to do everything, if you have to use every tool in your toolbox and you know you have no more tools to use, they're just going to go back and start recycling. And that's when people figure out, oh, I remember y'all did this last time. Y'all did that last time. It's the same thing. But they're going to reach back to their uh, bottle of Fanta, if that's is that what you're talking about. <laughs> Man, it makes, it makes us at the Knights of Columbus, uh, our, our uh, insurance, life insurance game look like a piece of crap. I can't believe this. Oh, you know, one 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 quick thing, um, Hotep Sophia, well, uh, one, one very – crucial part to all of this which not only affects uh black people in this country but everyone in this country is that because no one knows history after everyone uh after everyone got uh riled up in the 60s they stopped teaching civics in high school among other things like uh like civics and like home economics and and geography but but for me the biggest thing is civics because here we have like like for, for starters like we have people screaming, throwing things at other people, and inciting violence over topics they have zero understanding of, or at least an understanding of that is one volume wide and thousands of volumes deep, all right? Like, because history isn't immediately accessible and because civics is no longer in our curriculum, like, as soon as someone has, like, the slightest understanding of how government works or how government should work, that's all they need. So, like, that's one thing Black Lives Matter has capitalized on tremendously in being able to shape and scope a narrative of not just how things were, but how things should be. And no frame of reference to history available allows people to fall into that and lend themselves to it. And it's kind of a dangerous thing. It's part of what made last summer so... Um, um, I don't know what. <laughs> there you go. There you well, go. Well, no, I, I actually, um, it, you say it's in the '60s, and that's exactly when it happened. Because what another, what another thing that they did is, or people are not talking about, which is they should be, is the whole critical race theory. The theory came about like actually in writing. The seminal research on that came out in like '89, I think. And so what had been happening, because my parents were in college at the time, I'm, they went to school in 79. And what had been happening is that it had been just been percolating this whole pan-African, African nationalism, all this stuff started percolating through the colleges and whatever. And so you had all of these people with the Back to Africa movement and the Sunrise. Yeah, a lot of the expats of this, that had like trust funds, they went yeah. to... They went to like Lagos and Nairobi. Oh, and... Uh, yes. please, please excuse my interruption, but uh, did, did critical race theory come about from the Portland baseline essays in the late 80s, or am I mistaken? No, it, it actually came about there. Well, it could have. The original uh, published research where it was first actually 
um, a term that was accepted came out from the Harvard Law Review in 89. Ah, and okay. I have oh, wow. the actual research somewhere, but it's not. And it's funny because my dissertation actually um, is basically how uh, this CRT is literally useless for African-American entrepreneurship. But this was before it became a whole big deal, like with... Um, white nationalists, I guess. And so I'm hoping that like, they don't pull my dissertation because I talk extensively about how bad CRT is. Oh my goodness. Uh, anyway. Well, uh, <laughs> Hotep Sophia, there may be an organization that you'd like to get involved with called FAIR uh, with uh, Glenn Lowry. Do you know Glenn Lowry? I've heard of FAIR. Yes. So FAIR, I uh, recently met some of the people that are, are running it. So if you're interested, I can uh, link you up. And I think it would be an interesting conversation because you may see things a bit differently than they do in certain uh, respects, but they are also against the uh, critical race theory. And they're one of the uh, few people on the front lines right now that are actually doing something about all these, let's say, uh, all these teachers that uh, want to uh, that don't want to teach this critical race theory, and they end up getting in trouble with their school because of that, and they go to fair. Look, they, well, I'm going to reach out to them. Please do. Yeah. I'll, I'll hook you up. It like blows my mind though that like you know Nicole Hannah Jones feels like she's discredited more and more like every week, and yet there's been absolutely no pumping the brakes on them instituting the 1619 project into like regular public, like she's been discredited by like every major historian in America. And yet there's still like not even a sidebar discussion happening in mm. mainstream media about whether or not we should be you, you were teaching the race science, the, the race science like in Cause, public well, cause schools. They're, Cause they're afraid. Everybody's afraid to say anything, well, that's so that's the why point. this happens. And, but well, that, that should that, be... I, they Sorry, have ahead, common, I was going to say, because Common Core, I mean, they can't stop because they live... I like... <clears throat> what I'm always trying to get people to see is that this stuff started 100 years ago. So we're just getting the end result of a plan that's literally 200... We're, we're right. 100 years into a 200-year plan. So literally, they started on this whole thing in the early 1900s but but with the common core i mean they basically wrote it into common core so if it's like if if you are a person who attacks this one piece you have to attack it all and that's a part of their strategy by having everything so woven together that if you literally take out one stone you have to take out the whole wall which is why mm -hmm. you know i recommend people you know homeschool private school alternate school forget about school why are we even arguing about school yeah. i think the argument should not even be about this this is how backwards people are yeah oh i want the schools to do what i want no what you should say is what about separate but equal like we want our own schools where we don't teach that that mm -hmm. was a legitimate thing like they ruined, like, the Brown versus Board of Education was so no, deceptive see, because of there, there is but still, was great. There is still a problem for, let's say, if you're a parent and kids, let's say, for example, for example, let's say you're a mixed race family where you would be like uh, half black and uh, half white or whatever, and you would want to go to a particular school. You like the uh, you like the schedule there. You like the teachers. Uh, why should anybody prevent you from doing that of your own free will? That's the part that I uh, don't understand with uh, separate well, in, but equal. Er, in, in, well, separate but equal means that people you need with a one different job. philosophies <laughs> should have their own school, meaning you don't have to be. It's The separation wasn't necessarily oh. by color. That's just what we're hearing now. But if you look at the, the demographic makeup of various communities, most communities were at least somewhat mixed because there are as many black business owners as there were, there were white business owners. And because there was money to be made in the community, so there was a lot of mutual agreements about how things should be done in various communities. This is a thing that's just been, uh, I only know this because I, I got the information directly from my, my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents. Mm -hmm. I have that, you know, direct, and there's no, this not really written in the books the way that I'm describing it. But I do know that it happened this way, at least in Maryland. And Maryland was a Southern state, just as many slaves as anyone else. And Maryland is probably the worst of the Southern states because of 
its proximity to DC and to Philadelphia when it was the capital. So this is how things were. There were always white people in the community because all even all slaves weren't black. There was Indians and there were Irish that were treated equally as black slaves. They were all Hooray! The same. White, cargo. You... white cargo. <laughs> white cargo. White <laughs> cargo. White <laughs> cargo. You, you were gonna say if something you... about the the uh, this is the, the you were talking about this with um, Angie Speaks on your System of Systems podcast about how um, they they like she she said some like really crazy stuff. This uh, what's the date? Nineteen eighteen thirteen. Uh, Wait, what are you talking about? Sixteen nineteen. Sixteen nineteen. There you go. <laughs> Wasn't yeah. it re- recently? Uh, for those who don't know, like me, I'm I'm a leaf. So well, the entire you're with the 1619 project, and you know, granted, there's going to be differences in like the way all of us think on this show right now, and that's fine. But 1619, her claim was that the first slaves that came to America came here in 1619, but that was false. They were indentured right. servants. They were paid. They weren't paid well, but they weren't slaves. And then the 1619 Project goes on this very sort of long, elaborate tale that is basically trying to make the case that capitalism (laughs) was created to make slavery and not the fact that slavery was... Well, sla- yeah, slavery was a was an economic necessity to a new Western power trying to rapidly and to rapidly modernize itself. It's not that people created slavery because they innately hated each other. It was because slavery was a way to make free labor, and then white supre- American white supremacy became the ideological justification for yeah. the necessity of an economic but, relation. But 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 the sixteen nineteen project is kind of. Um, kind of scummy for insinuating that the American Revolution happened because they had to defend slavery and England of abolished course. slavery. All and that England shit. never had slaves. England right. is the best thing in the history of anything ever. Oh, it, can it, I they, talk about they, that? They, they, they deny the <laughs> radical character of a lot of this. They, they deny like the mm. radical progressive character of a lot of steps forward in history and, right. and cast like, out upon everything, which is innately, in my mind, fucking satanic. Yeah, it's yeah. it's 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 historically inaccurate at best and intellectually dishonest at worst. Yeah. Because it essentially removes um it, it takes away so much context and it basically it, it, it it's also lying by omission because uh Hotel mm-hmm. Sophia, I'm glad you brought up uh the Irish slaves. Like proof of this is the fact that if you go to Jamaica You'll see people who straight up look like honkies and out their mouth comes the heaviest patois like this side of the Mississippi. Yeah. Like, and while we're at it, like, you know, like the, the one thing about the, all the talk of reparations and, and because <sighs> slavery is being put at the forefront of discussions, like for starters, are, are, if we talk about reparations, would, shouldn't we go in chronological order? Like, like a lot of people got enslaved before the Middle Passage. For starters, all right. The Middle Passage is a lie. Can we just? I just have to. This is black. Wait, what's okay? Okay, here. there's there's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on here. here. So first, Hotep Sophia, what is the Middle Passage? Okay, the Middle Passage is allegedly this um, transatlantic loop where people went from America to Africa, then back to sort of like south africa and then back up to america or the the middle east um the the west indies i mean and then sort of back up but it didn't happen like the whole basis of the 1619 project which is why when i when they first started talking about it, i ignored it because i said well black people were already here black people were already here this is this is like a lot of uh well-established research has been done on this and the one point that i will make to make that point is that all of the alleged slave manifests are volunteer information only, which means you can go onto a slave manifest right now and put down people who was there and they will accept that as true. It is literally a lie. It's complete fabrication of what happened. It just did not happen. There's no way they could have brought as many people here in the time period they said, uh, in the way that they said, it's literally impossible. It's, it has been a lot of 
um, you know, alternate research on that because it, it's the the amount of time that it would take to make the journey is the is it's Three with months. the type of votes that they had at the time, they couldn't do it. They couldn't bring as many thousands people as they said boats. that they well, they couldn't have been moving thousands of boats because you had to build the boats. These things all take time. It like you you yeah. know, it's it's well, a, I don't know. Two, I don't know what that's to be. That's kind of I mean no, we I've, kinda I've we kinda had of, there were major fleets of boats traveling the world for a thousand years at that point. Right, but the way as many people as they, if you look at the actual what they not what we have heard, but the actual dates that they say. Once you start looking at the actual dates, the actual manifest that they say is what happened. The things cannot happen the way that they say that they did. Now they did bring some people from Africa. I'm not saying they didn't bring anybody, but there's no way they could have brought as many people as they say they did. What happened was. A lot of there was a lot of dark skinned people already here that they would have called natives like the Native Americans are actually been bred. It's, it's a very subversive thing like they, so, they so bred a lot of natives to make them lighter so that you could say that the blacks and, and I've gotten to many arguments with Native Americans about this because they don't like it, but there's no other way to explain all of the stuff that's happened. I mean, this just couldn't happen the way that they said it did. And there's a lot of history that actually backs that up. Like they said the first ship came to Virginia. Well, you know, there's a guy, Dane Calloway, he went and looked at the research. He put it out for everybody to see. They couldn't have gone to Virginia. They went to Massachusetts. Well, why would they say that? I mean, there's a lot of things that don't add up in actual well, black history. Well, Sophia, just to be clear, when we're talking about a uh black people originally in America, we're specifically, are we specifically talking about uh, black people who would be closer to, let's say, the uh, Bantus in uh, Western Africa, or what would be the origin point, let's say, of the black people who came much earlier to the United States? I don't think they came, well, so you, I think you had blacks coming from Africa in numbers that predate the slave trade. So when I say black people were already here, but there was literally a lot of black people had already been going mm. back and forth because you have to think of people like Mansa Musa who had like, you know, all this money. Like there was a lot of money churning around Africa. So people were, uh, people in Africa were already making this, this trek. Mm. So there were already dark skinned people here. So that's, I mean, and even the term black, I mean, this is this whole thing is very, very confusing, especially yeah. for people who haven't even had to live it. But me, you know, being a black person and just, okay, talk to my grandmother, talk to my great grandmother. I had the very, uh, I've been very fortunate that I had, you know, people who kept, you know, accurate records. And I've been able to have a lot of conversations with people because a lot of this history isn't written. There's nowhere it's been written. But all I can do is go back and say, like my undergraduate degree is in African-American studies. So when I learn something at school, I will go to my grandmother and my great grandmother and my great aunt to them. And I will say, well, what about this? I heard this in school. And they'd be like, mm, I don't think so because boom, 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 this is what happened. This is where we were. This is so on and so on and so forth. You know, I got a lot of direct information. And that's the problem with a lot of history is that it's oral history. So if you go back and say, like the stuff that I'm saying, I can show you the the correlated the correlative as evidence, but that doesn't necessarily mean that a historian like a, a university historian would accept mm. it due to the fact that it goes so far against their uh, understanding of history um that you know it would they would basically be giving up the, it's the same thing with yeah. these um L L these like scientists what? people they would be giving up everything if they believe what individual scientists or individual researchers oh, uh, say just real a quick question like so if you have like have you ever faced pushback like have like have you ever been in a scenario where like let's say you're talking to a historian and they dismiss what it is you're saying and you go well i have primary sources that can verify what i'm saying have you ever been faced with oh well that covers your story what about everyone else as as if they're trying to like explain away your context 
but where like I have to begrudgingly accept because this is a this is a primary source. However, the Wikipedia article that I edit every week obsessively like a neurotic and compulsive shrew, eh, it doesn't <laughs> match up. It doesn't match up to the Sophia. Sorry. So you're well, that's that, why like... I'm getting my doctorate because it's much harder to argue with a person like me when I have doctor in front of my name and I make everyone call me doctor. So that's the like the number like I know black entrepreneur, African American entrepreneurship. I know it back to the 1700s at this point. It's going to be real difficult for you to argue with me when you come say, "Oh, well, black people didn't own anything. They didn't do anything." Well, I have a record right here of all the black slaves that black people own. It's it was in the um uh, the census data, you know, and Carter G. Woodson had compiled it. It's in a book. Oh, well, uh, that I, uh, I'm like, you're going to argue with Carter G. Woodson? Like, and I'm a doctor. You're going to argue with me? Like, that, that's the only way well, I find you can well, attack well, these wait, people you're is you're saying, you're saying well, we, we have something that, that, like, the definition of black people, like, in America should be expanded to include a lot of different other, like, haplo groups. Like, I know there's a lot of, uh, blacks who have, um, uh, indigenous ancestry, for instance, and maybe that, like, along the way, there was sort of like, um, I don't know, um, the the sort of like typical story of um, black slavery is like more nuanced. You're saying then? Like, yes, but, and I I think but that we can I... find all this out through uh, genetic uh, testing. We've unlocked the human genome. I'm yeah, sure that's that a if lot you of want to give things... the government your DNA, which I would never do. I can only <laughs> yeah. tell you what I know based on my own family records. Well, like, I'm not giving the government you, okay, my, you anybody may not, my DNA. You may not want to, but eventually I think there is going to be enough people that will that we're going to be able to map out kind of like who came from where where, and when. I think this is something that's going to be And accessible. that's going to be well, a huge no, but problem to Adam's because... point, though... Oh, go, go ahead. What's up? I, I was saying that's going to be a huge problem because there's a lot of people who are going to be thinking that they can get reparations when, in fact, they their parents are oh. lying to them about their own history. Like reparations you have, is never going to happen. I know it's never yeah. going to happen. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Like it makes no sense at all. It, but it, I'm just saying people need pe people need basic quality of life things, mm. healthcare, you know, like something like reparations. How do you, you have a case where someone is like 98% white and then like 2% descendant of a slave. Yeah, and you wouldn't know, well, I mean- But that's what, I, the but whole, that's what I'm, uh, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. It's all right. But yeah, no, the reparations case is just a thing that like left academics have been throwing into the discourse for 35 years, knowing mm. full yeah. well, it doesn't make yeah. any fucking sense. Yeah. And the... oh, by the way, do you know do you know what does make sense? The slime. What do you guys think of the slime so far? That's uh, that I've been drawing over here, going Ooh. on the head of Deer Man. The the, the 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 shading on the drool. I I Burst. really admire. It's it's the attention. To... See, that's what I mean, love. Like the attention to well, detail. We're going to talk about NFTs soon. Oh, yes. they're, they're oh but 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 ju just a uh, they're just not. To build on, on on what you were saying very quickly in regards to. Um, reparations i've always seen it as like a shining city on the hill goal that like you'll never get to but as long as you keep pushing for and striving towards and keep putting it to the forefront of discussion and using it to browbeat anyone who even mildly disagrees with you it has been very effective in helping shape a narrative but yeah i but mean like sorry go ahead pal oh, oh, oh my, my bad dude i just wanted to end real quickly like in your opinion and, and, and Hotep Sophia, I'd like your, your opinion on this. Actually, everyone chime in. Uh, would we be better oh, off? Done, would, guys. would we be, damn oh, it, God. we're going to give 40 acres and a mule oh, to the guineas in Canada while we're at it, Gio, okay? Well, so, well, well Trudeau so, had to apologize to us recently, <clears> so. Really? Because um, my great grandfather, my great uncle was, sorry, my great uncle was uh, in the uh, internment camp. And he was a based Mussolini supporter. So. <laughs> but although I will say I have a great, like my great uncle, he supported Mussolini. But my grandfather, great grandfather, at one point, um, my great uncle on my father's side uh, were diehard uh, card carrying uh, co communist members. Um, really? Yeah. So, uh, no, no one can bet a thousand, Gio. No one can bet a thousand. So I have like a very diverse array of uh, political yeah. opinions in my blood. My dad's side of the family are all bougie 
Jewish communist. Oh, man. <laughs> like the type Which that, you can um... probably like, I, I, I like constantly am fighting against that. I mean, my papa wasn't like, you know, he was like a, he was into Adorno and shit like that. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, by, t- by, by like standards of today's communists, he would obviously be like, these people are fucking insane. Oh, but... so, so, so safety propaganda versus the limousine liberals. Round one, <laughs> fight. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, but, but... That's like Duddy Kravitz oh, where they were. Gio, like... check this out. I thought you'd appreciate this. We oh, got let me fucking... see this. I just bought these two paintings by Darya Bahajik. The collage here, and then this. Oh my God! Wait, let me let me pin this thing here. Wait, Gio, don't speak so that we could see that picture in full, in this full thing. Although I could pin it, actually. Hold on. Yeah, pin. Let me try to pin this. Oh my God! (laughs) Holy crap! Here we go. Nice. Look at that. Yep. There you go. She's a friend of mine. She gave me she gave me an insane deal on these. Oh my God. That's beautiful. And, uh, if, I ever and by- get, if I ever get to travel out of this godforsaken place, I like the first place I want to go to. It seems all my friends are in New York City, so that's. Uh, <laughs> I would just like to say about the reparations thing. See, the problem with that is that again, black people don't know understand their history. A lot of black people received uh, land or or money or whatever when. Um, when slavery ended. So they're gonna, this is why the whole thing to me is like an insane sort of thing to say, because yes, there were some people that didn't receive anything, but a lot of people did. I, just like after when when emancipation time came, because basically what happened, this is another thing people just don't understand. When emancipation came, basically it was um, union soldiers riding around to the plantation telling the um you know telling people that they were free and then they had nowhere to go they didn't know what to do because they were slaves they had no idea what was going on so a lot of them may de- if they didn't leave right away because they had family already in the north or something like that they made deals with the plantation owners to stay because they had nowhere else to go they there was nothing else for them to do they didn't know anything else or they were old or whatever like the whole way that it happened is just kind of like people don't want to get into the details, but there's lots of firsthand accounts of people who were there at the time telling you, look, this is what happened when the account, I, one of the accounts I just read recently was in Booker T. Washington's book. He talked about it. He was like, there were people who went back to, you know, and said, look, we need to say, let's make some type of arrangements because they didn't have anywhere else to go. They didn't have anything else to do. And a lot of people received land on my grandmother's side and my grandfather's side on my mom's side both received land. And on my dad's side, my grandmother received land. And my great my grandfather on my dad's side was Indian. So that was a whole different thing. But so that's why I'm like, how would it even work? Like, who even knows? Like you most people black people can't even trace their line back more than a generation or two. You're talking about eight, nine, 10 generations. I know my eight, 10, nine, 10 generations, but most people don't. So this is why the whole thing of even of it even being possible is gonna come out to be a lie. And then you're well, gonna have these people who are, you know, from Jamaica or whatever island saying, oh, I need reparations too. No, you get reparations from the queen. Like <laughs> you can't get them from <laughs> America's. Like how is that even like- What's well, really funny though, how Hotep, like how, um, you have like these like bourgeois academics, like there was a moment during the Obama period where like you'd have people writing like ridiculous shit like um, Obama spoke to like the black soul of America and you have like Tanishi Coates who had like the book about oh, reparations. God. And then even in the art world, you have um, if, if you go to my YouTube channel, me and Matthew, uh, we we had the our fifth episode recently of our style talks uh, art podcast and we talk about the recent sanford biggers um statue and we were going through his other works and some of them are like the the gelatin plate one where it's like the little like slave figurines in the ship and like each ship is a wing in the american flag and it's like all of this sort of mythologizing of it which i mean some of it is totally warranted if you are a descendant of black people that came to america in slave ships but I think, like, there's a point where it just becomes a uh, kind of weird, like, fetishization. Like, I know people accuse Kara Walker 
for instance, of that. Yeah. But by the way, uh, I want to call out Stane Haynes. Did you say the term limousine liberal or leftoid recently? Did you say the term leftoid? Because I have I have news for you, pal. Did you know the term leftoid? Apparently, according to our uh, brilliant uh, black <laughs> no. intellectual and artist, uh, <laughs> our good no, friend. No, I didn't want to hear this friend, fucking name. Uh, Bullish girl boss Elioso said, anyone using the term leftoid on here is just racist. It's rooted in racial pseudoscience term like Mongol. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that shit. Just, just real, real, real quickly, real oh, quickly. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to, to bring up earlier and get people's opinions on this in regards to reparations. Would it have been e like even if if something were to like let's say act of God, um, a Biden comes out of his cryogenic sleepy time dementia chamber and he goes, "All right, all black people get forty acres and a mule. Get to it." Like, would that help? In any no. capacity, that would like, make everything worse. I think that is no. Have you seen the yeah. Chappelle show? Do you know what black people would do with the money? <laughs> it's all the Chappelle show. Go ahead, Adam, please. Before she, okay. but she here is, is but here is the thing like, and, and jewelry. That's it. And we're we're living in cocaine. That's it. <laughs> no, right. Newport, Wait, and then Tommy Newport. Truck of Newport. Right, I'm gonna Newport. give a more. I'm gonna give a more <laughs> rational. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go for the the, the cool collected answer about why reparations wouldn't make sense, oh, but man. also why we might see a huge push for them. Listen, Hotep, the reason in the next is, ten years is because Adam literally has an army of people that like. Li like look at everything that he does and uh, and they just like go after him nonstop. But, but I want. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, it's all right. It's cool. It's just. <laughs> but yeah. Go ahead, Adam. Please. Oh my um, god. <laughs> I think actually, because we're living. All right, so we're living in this time when critical race theory is sort of being indoctrinated, and it's but it's clearly being used as a tool. Uh, a new tool of subjugation against working class, more people like more broadly. I don't think oh, it's yeah. unlikely that we'll see a massive push for reparations over the next 10 years, because it's a way to create even more tension. Just as like, when I was a kid growing up with like pretty normie Gen X, older Gen X parents, they told me, don't judge people based on the color of their skin. Like it seemed like such a normal thing to teach your kids. Don't judge people based on their religion or, or whatever. Like just sort of like normy liberal views that I think are worth holding on to. And now they're telling us we have to only see each other through the lens of, they're not allowed to say like race in a scientific way. So they like, Mm. boil it down to culture which again is like an abstraction and a way to confuse and disorient people but well, i yeah. really think we will see like a push for reparations because all of a sudden you'll have this huge organization effort at a time of mass poverty in america that is not that is experienced by americans of all colors and all races and you're going to have this push for this huge program that will only benefit 20% of the population at most. It's more ways to start a fucking insane race amounts war. of tension and race war. Yeah. Of okay. Who is Lisa Bode talking about? Because I will go on and on about the terrors of Cardi B and Beyonce. So I hope she is not talking about me. <laughs> I, I'm just sorry. This is driving me crazy. Like, no, don't I, you need to say who you're talking to when you make but, these comments. Oh, Cause uh, it better not be me. That's by the way, ahead, by the way, real, real quick, real quick. I just want to say that if you want the stream to keep going, you got to pay us some scratch. So what you have to do is you have to go to streamlabs.com slash left polyakov slash tip. I'm going to post it in the chat right now. You so have you to invest in Lev. Invest, invest in Lev, exactly. 
exactly. So, but with that being said, I also wanted to let you know that I was at this uh, this fair event where these teachers were talking about how in their school they had all the black teachers, like the administration, they had all the black teachers group into one area and all the white teachers group onto, into this other area, like almost like separate praying groups, uh, if you want to call it that. You know what I mean? So already there's these things that are going on right now, which is very much yeah, against, I, uh, yeah. I don't understand why that needs to be enforced or institutionalized. Like people can congregate however they wish to, like, yeah, I mean, I, I mean to to talk about what Hotep Sophia was talking about. Her point, from what I understand, is you want people to have freedom of association. But my only thing here is I want to make sure that when people want to associate with somebody who's different from them in terms of skin features or origin or whatever, that they'll have every opportunity to do so. That's just the only thing that I want to stress here. Like uh, that, I want to make sure would be kept in a vision where let's I mean, say a lot of yeah well that was all i mean oh, the man. thing about it is that because history is just not taught well is it this is this was never a problem integration would have happened naturally it was already first of all how can you be uh the 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 um what do you call it the the separation the discrimination was from rich people and poor people it was class and then class was too hard to maintain so they went for the easier route of skin color like when irish people what? found out in in uh whoever found out they were all of a sudden in the white category that was news to them i've talked to a lot of people they had no idea they were like well I didn't know I was white. Like I was never white. I was. That's why Italians. they always considered we JFK. White. Exactly. JFK yeah. was the first black president. Like this is just how it was. <laughs> so like this is the type of stuff that is like to the way they've just redefined language <laughs> so much that that nobody. I mean, my he my was in more ways than one. He was my great grandparents. Every ever since my people could vote, they voted oh, Republican. Man. This was a new thing. Like when they did the march on Washington, that's when the black people started to vote Democrat. But prior to that, blacks voted Republican. Like that is a known fact. It's just the propaganda around this is so intense that you don't even understand how the history works or what the right. history is. You know what I mean? So it's like I don't it's vote, hard to what, explain. I mean I, I never vote, but like when people call people fascists now, what they mean is that they don't vote Democrat. You know, that's like that's like the only fucking that's like the only meaning of that word anymore. But that's like that a basic um like to Adam's Biden. point, that's that's like a basic Foucauldian um, I believe it was in Society Must Be Defended, right. where, the chapter about racism, where he said that, um, which is, again, what Hotep Sophia is saying, is that um, racism was a creation in some ways of a, like, state project that, like, basically used um, emerging practices within the sciences to justify a sort of apparatus of power and to like sort of easily slot people. Um, and I think the problem is that the wokes, they sort of take um, a bastardized version of that. And they say that while well, um, racism is like a tool of like the state, but it's, it's almost like in a weird say in a weird way, racism is still a tool of the state but in sort of like it's inverted way right, where reverse yeah reverse yeah mm. I, I mean, mean yeah, so I mean, Gio, reverse what... is a weird term but yeah i get what she by the way what do you think of my uh, what do you think of my little mouse man over here oh that's pretty cute yeah well, he's they gonna still... be he's gonna be sitting in the tongue by the way see this is where this is his home oh, oh. Is <laughs> you know well what sophia said about um there used to be division between class, but they made it race because it was easier. I think they made it race because it was less coherent. Yeah. Because if you yeah, have people, true. I mean, it, class is very coherent. Like that's it, like, a, yeah, exactly. Of... Like I, it doesn't matter how we, if you're making 30 grand a year, busting your ass for some, and you own nothing, then you share that in common with someone, despite whatever cultural racial or, 
religious mm. difference you might have. That's wait, just wait, did you, did you just say you, you, you'll owe nothing? And does that mean you'll be happy? <laughs> you'll be ecstatic. You'll own nothing and be in ecstasy. But, no, you, will be, is, you will be wallowing in your... And I don't want to wanna get... I don't want to be like the, the annoying Mark Soited guy on this, but Marx's class analysis is, is correct. I mean, he... You could you could make the argument that he, like his biggest mistake was his uh, foresight on revolution. It didn't happen the way he thought it would. But his class analysis is correct. People in power have always known that it was correct, and for the last hundred and fifty years, they have had to create ideological mechanisms to make ordinary people feel divided. But in reality, they're not. And if you have common interests, the whole point of this shit is that you don't you don't need to agree on shit. You just want to have a better life. You want to have more security and stability. That's what politics is supposed to be about, about stabilizing society. Hmm. But a but dictatorship <laughs> but to be fair though, a dictatorship of the proletariat, I don't really think it's been shown to create the kind of stability that uh, Marx envisioned. So as it's far as It's never been done. Well, I mean, that's what they all say. <laughs> I mean, no, laugh, we can on, we can talk can... about that all day. I'm just saying on the mm. on the sheer class analysis, he was correct. Yeah, as as I mean, like, whether as, I don't want to do the is Soviet Union communist or not. Like, it's not really what I'm interested in right now. I'm just talking about mm. why these racial all... ideologies have manifested to the degree that they have. Although, although for a future for a future conversation, not right now, but for a future one, I would be interested in taking apart not whether the USSR was or wasn't uh, the true communism, but more whether any attempt at creating that kind of system at all would result in something like the USSR or other examples. In other yeah, words, I have like, to get out my yeah. crystal ball. I have no idea. All I know is that. See, the reason why I, I don't close myself off to any of this stuff, because then the pe people have to make the argument that, like, there's ever been a stable political economy and capitalism. And I think at this moment in history, it's clear to say, <laughs> not really. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Like, well, not not really in comparison to what? Because if we have uh, if we have a uh, a ruler with a, a gradient all the way from everybody has enough. Like in uh, Norway, for example, everybody has more than enough to live healthy, uh, to eat, whatever, all the way to, I don't know, Mogadishu or all the way to somewhere where it's just like an absolute hell on earth. Everybody's being persecuted. Everybody's watching their back and uh, uh, sitting, uh, standing on bread lines. So if that's like the gradient from one to the other, then mm -hmm. that's how we can compare whether one place is going to be leaning more towards uh, uh, Mugadishu or leaning more towards uh, Norway. Yeah, but Norway is the way it is. All right, now we have... Ugh. You're going to make me do the whole fucking thing now, Lev. Come on. Well, now, it's, got, on. it's got the oil. Let's, let's move on. I know it's got the oil. I wanted to talk about... Well, I wanted to make a point. Uh, and um, butt breaking. Oh, I said the I, I, Well, I, I wanted to piggyback on something Gio said. And also something, Adam, you were saying, too. Um, one of the things that I found in my research is that um, <clears throat> a lot of this does go back to, I wouldn't say capitalism per se, but like the success of entrepreneurs, of especially Black entrepreneurs. And I'll go back to the insurance situation because a lot of stuff that happened in insurance is literally applies to us today. So what happened was some of the Black insurers were so good at getting clients or whatever, and because there were, you know, numerically more Blacks in the South than there were whites. So what would happen is you had the, um, you had the, the white insurance companies like Prudential use science to say that Blacks couldn't and shouldn't be insured. And then what happened was they, it's kind of like a eugenicist racial whatever thing, but they use that to try and put black insurance companies out of business because the black insurance companies were doing 
so much better than the white insurance companies. And it's the same thing with the banks. Like the first bank to open after the collapse um, in, in 1929 was a black bank in North Carolina, um, you know, because it didn't, it wasn't involved in all these risky bets or whatever, like the white banks were. So the whole uh, business aspect of what was happening in the black community and what was happening with black dollars is one of the reasons why things sort of shook out the way that they were because the white, a, a lot of these corporate white companies, they couldn't compete with the black companies. And so they just made up rules. They just said blacks were inferior and couldn't be insured. You know, th just like the FBI statistics, the government, they're putting out all this information. They're saying that, you know, blacks are this, blacks are that. And, and it really caused a whole lot of problems. And, and, one of the things that used to happen was, and in, in back to sort of what Lev was talking about with the integration thing, one of the things that happened was yeah. communities funded their yeah. own schools, yeah. you know, like mm. they literally paid for their own schools within the community. So, and they would pay the teachers directly and that's how it worked. So what happened was, you know, some of the black schools didn't have as much stuff as the white school. So that's why the, the original lawsuit came about. But what happened was the NAACP got in there and, and demanded that the plaintiffs demand um, integration, but that's not what they wanted. They literally just wanted the same amount of funding that the white schools were getting. And this goes back to this whole board of education, which never should have been started. So like I, me, I'm always going to put the problems at the foot of the government. The government trying to intrude on private citizens is what you know, cause a lot of this stuff to shake out. Like with the insurance, then the state started requiring that some insurance companies like the secret societies, they didn't have to have any money on hand. They could do whatever they wanted. And then some of the insurance companies, like the black ones, they had to have all this stuff, a million dollars in today's mm. money and all this like stuff they had to have in order to get started. But that was because the regulations of the government started to come in and really you know, mess with the businesses. They didn't let the free market operate. So saying that capitalism is the problem, and it's it's really the government, you know, overstepping into the alleged free market, which would be free if the government would stay out of it, but they won't stay out of it. So it's never well, going to be, you I know. I would disagree there because, I mean, in a capitalist state, the state really exists to keep capital flowing to right. to facilitate the flow of global capital which is why we live i mean right now in america the will of the working class is only represented in electoral politics about two percent of the time which is fucking insane the other 98 right. percent of the time is all uh people who own and people who are in power but with the working class itself though when you're talking about it being this collective will the examples that I've so far seen of any time people talk about it in theory and practice, it ends up being a commission of people who are in charge that always speak on behalf of the workers, not the workers no, themselves. No, you're not wrong. I mean, that's the, I mean, there's been pretty much every historical communist movement so far has had uh, a, uh, a party. And I don't actually believe, I mean, I could, I could do this historical shit like all day. Like I, I don't, <laughs> I, I think I respect Vladimir Lenin because I know that he had an insane amount of very real problems that were presented to him and he dealt with them. One thing I can say about him is that he was very, very serious about dealing with the problems that he had in front of him in a mm. serious way. They didn't by, work by, out. By starving the peasantry. That was well, one of the things that he did by... Well, uh, well I mean, it was... No, no, I mean, let's be, let's be realistic about this. Lenin was a guy with a lot of libido. He loved to have a lot of sex. And he, yeah. uh, you know, he had that vril inside of him. That he I was think, also uh, trained by the Brits, so I mean, we could yeah, really well, like address this where the problem. I gotta, I, began, I gotta look but... in, I gotta look into that as well. But my only point is that you're always going to have some kind of a hierarchy develop, even in the lowest setting of a town well, hall meeting. I don't even, I don't even deny that. I mean, 
how did we get into this conversation again? Oh yeah, the, 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 what, what the role of the state is in capitalism. Yeah. Um, yeah, there will probably be always be a centralized power. I'm, I'm not even here yeah. to deny that, but the uh, tipping of ownership in favor of- But I mean, that's right the now, antithesis of what the founding fathers wanted. It's the centralized power is exactly what they were fighting against. I mean, that's. I think that's just like, it drives me nuts. Like this is what they, exactly what is happening is exactly what they didn't want. And this is, and yet this is exactly what we have. And, and there's no way to like unravel it and, and get away from it. But I mean, that's just one of the, con that's like a contradiction of our political economy. They can say that they want everyone to have access to this free market, but capital tends to accumulate at the top and monopoly is one of its contradictions. So now we live in a time where capital is incredibly concentrated in a very few hands. Well, but it was that happened, always that happened before with the trust, and then we got FDR yeah. to come in there and kick some ass. And uh, uh, well, I wouldn't want to hold up better. FDR as the uh, no, not FDR. I always the get them deal, confused. Uh, I always mm -hmm. get them confused. Not FDR. I meant to say TR, Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, sorry, Teddy Roosevelt. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Fu fuck FDR. Yeah, he FDR was a did the opposite. Actually. Yeah, he was a, he was a communist uh, uh, collaborator. Well, but, uh, yeah, he was, the communists were on his ass to get the New Deal done. Otherwise, probably yeah. wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think, yeah, like, whatever happened. No, no, but, but there is like, an example, too. Catholic TR. antitrust laws, like, that came from a lot of, like, uh, Catholic politicians. I mean, what happened yeah. to the antitrust laws? They've sort of been, like, yeah. systematically murdered. But, because but, Gio, the fact that they the... happened, the fact that there were these laws that people brought in, that's a shining example of how this system, as bad as it is, has an opportunity to be fixed. What I don't want to happen is for people who are too agitated right now to introduce a system that's going to do the complete opposite of what they intend and basically end up putting everybody in a fucking gulag. If we already have an alternative we're to not that. Gonna see, gulags, love. We're not yeah. going to see anything remotely... I mean... The, you don't. Uh, you don't. You don't have a crystal ball like you said, so you can't. No, say that. I know, but I. I really don't see the kind of politics that I want to see happen happening in my lifetime. I mean, the 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 left that exists now has really nothing to do with any of this shit. Like they are managerial, nambla leftists. <laughs> you know, yes. Like, that, that, that is what they are, or Fabians. I mean, if you look back at the Fabians in the United Kingdom, it's very close yeah, to they are what our like, leftists hmm. look like. Like an above middle class. But when, like but when did the left Knowledge class. workers. Yeah, like, okay, knowledge, but when, exactly, yeah. But when were yeah. the leftists preferable? Because if we're looking at, let's say, the 30s and 40s, most of the high chic leftists during that time, they were full-fledged Stalinists. These in problems fact, are historical. They've always, I mean... Marxism was in response to his hatred and contempt for the bourgeois, the bourgeois socialists and anarchists of the time. These sure. problems and contradictions have always been in place. Right now, we're at the apotheosis of these trends where yeah. pretty much every fucking leftist that you come across is a liar to themselves, most of all, and to the rest of us. They always divert to power. They don't approach it they don't they don't approach it with anything resembling critique or dissent they divert to it pretty much all the time um, I, 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 I don't if i could just interrupt uh, very quickly to um uh i don't want to write it off as time is a flat circle and discourse is a flat circle but uh it, it, at at what point in american politics did the working class eventually become like because uh, you know how things in this country, it starts out as like an emergency, a panic, a crisis, and then it just fades into the background, like AIDS, homelessness, you know, crack. Like, uh, so, yeah. so, so, um, because the, <laughs> so because the middle class is going to go extinct. All right. Yeah. It, it's not going <laughs> to exist by the end of the 2020s. Um, at what point did the working class, because like I, I, I'd like to believe that like, uh, you know, the the hippies had some idea of the working class, but Phil Oakes, uh, he was a folk singer. Like he was, he like he he started to do things like embrace John Wayne ironically because it would piss off soft hand left leaning pieces of shit that like he was like surrounded by all the time. Like, uh, 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 
would you say that there has been a deliberate and this kind of builds on what Hotep Sophia mentioned earlier, like, w would you say that there has been a deliberate shift of avoiding discussion of wealth as the one true privilege where like identity politics has replaced wealth in terms of privilege, like preventing meaningful discourse? Uh, would you say that has happened in your lifetime or ours? Well, I would say in the black community, it sort of started with the Harlem Renaissance because um, you had these rich black people essentially making this art and writing stories and all this stuff in Harlem. And this was, I think, like around this was the, during 30s. the Harlem Renaissance. Yeah, this was. Yeah, like during the 30s. And, and but that was in, of course, in a northern state, uh, not in the south, which is has a totally different culture. And all of a sudden, this philosophy, you know, which was definitely a uh, Marxist philosophy, gets pushed onto the Black community as our uh, history. But when you look at a lot of the artists from the time of the Harlem Renaissance, a lot of them weren't Black Americans. They were they were from other places. So this, uh, this whole uh, thing sort of started for in our community around that time, that's when it, I mean, it really started, I would say with, with uh, entrepreneurship or with the business community, it started with um, uh, Du Bois coming in and talking about how, you know, his, his whole Niagara movement and, you know, saying that there's a talented 10% that should be, uh, you know, managing the other 90% of the, the Blacks that are sort of you know, unknowledgeable, and and that's that that was at the turn of the century. He was mm -hmm. he was writing his stuff in in eighteen ninety nine. I have, a, so. I have a question about that that actually that statement. So when he was talking about that, did he have any intention of wanting the rest of the people who would be following this small percentage to eventually get to that same level, or at least to a higher level? No, than they were no, now? they wanted to keep the ninety percent. As the ninety percent and the ten percent who were the the talented ones were the ones who were supposed to be uh, uh, running the whole black community. And one of his phrases was, "Cast your um, cast your harness on a star instead of on a donkey or something like that." No, they literally wanted to, it to be completely separate, and that shows mm. in a lot of you know how things are now you have a group of people in in the black community like a Tariq. well he's kind of iffy they they kind of like him but don't but uh, <laughs> yeah. like this hannah nicole jones and these people who are representing the black community what they think they're the only ones who are allowed to represent the black community so when you have somebody come in with a differing voice then they're like oh no you're not allowed to represent the black community which is why you have a lot of black republicans or black trump reporters who were essentially you know xed out the black guy who ran in florida who's um he tried to join the congressional black caucus and they wouldn't let him He's black. I mean, this is this is what happens. Like, no, only we're allowed to represent mm. blackness. And you find out those people who are assigned to represent black people are not actually black. They're not black Americans. Well, they have no history in, in black America. They know nothing about black people, really. They just know how well, that's, to it's funny you mentioned speak that. the vernacular. It's funny you mentioned the Harlem Renaissance before, because um, me and Matthew, when we were covering um, the Biggers uh, monstrosity, I think it's still up there. No, maybe it got, yeah, it's still up till the end of the month in uh, the Rockefeller Center. Um, I thought it was going to be there permanent. Oh, uh, they're going to move it somewhere else. Uh, it's only there till the end of June, I think. Hmm. Um, oh, it could be. Maybe they might make it permanent. I mean, uh, like, it's funny because the Harlem Renaissance was like, you had painters like, um, who was the famous one? I, I covered this. I can't believe I forgot his name uh was it harris something um like you had this for for first time like this sort of weird coming together of like original black art from the south and the north and it was a totally like organic thing but now you have like people it was like, completely not organic but i i digress well well you know what i mean like it was <laughs> <laughs> oh my god but, every but, time yeah every time well it wasn't organic in the sense that a lot of them the more well-educated ones they were like learning 
art practices, either in music or visual art from like a lot of European imports that were coming at the time. But at the same time, you had like nowadays you have people like Sanford Biggers who comes from California and who's like wife is like this big like real estate Fucking mogul. Hate Sanford Biggers. Yeah, word. but like he's like LARPing this like oh, I want to re I want to you know rebirth of the Harlem Renaissance and he's like doing all of this stuff. But when you really look at it, he's probably more influenced by like European conceptions of like. And like history generation, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. And his chimeras are basically like taking a like really weird like, um, Ital like Italian or Greek restaurant versions of yeah. European art Dude. and taking like not even original conceptions of African. Dude, uh, but that's what, uh, but that's what the Harlem Renaissance was was an influx of this European. Um, uh, whatever into the black community and they were gassing them up and, and, and spending money on this stuff because it wasn't black people buying this stuff and it certainly wasn't black people funding these artists because that's not the way that the community works. Well, so it's still it, not. The Harlem Renaissance. No, it's still <laughs> not. It's still yeah. not. Wait, go ahead, Adam, you had a point then, Alexandria? Um, oh, well, I was just, I, I was just thinking about this. I mean, cause I talk about this sort of stuff all the time. And and of course, I don't want to suggest that it's like just white people who are collectors, it's rich people in general, but mm -hmm. you know, Again, in that, but in that, in that, in that, in that essay that I wrote, Art's Moral Fetish, I yes. cited Arthur yeah. Jaffa's video. Um, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Like yeah, super propaganda video. <laughs> um, I, I, I was kind of just like, I had a meeting and then I was like gallery hopping like a few weeks ago and I waltzed into a uh, Gladstone gallery. Oh, and I didn't yeah. And he just curated, he curated like a series, he curated like a Maplethorpe show. And I walked in there yeah. and uh, he, he chose like, it was like all the really gay, like gay images, like, yeah. like dicks all over the place. The pissing like, one, huge the pissing dicks, one. You know? Yeah. But he was touring the show that he curated and here's like, it was just such a funny image. Cause I, I was like nervous. Cause I thought maybe he recognized me or knew that I wrote that kind of a nasty little paragraph about him. But here he is like, he's like schmoozing these four super bougie, rich old, what old white ladies. And I was like, that is the history of uh, American art right there, which is mm -hmm. like, let's yeah. sell back these radical ideologies to these fucking rich ladies, you know? That's so, well, I was asking you um, in our chat how uh, Matthew Barney got funding for the Cremaster cycle. You're like, oh, well, he basically I slept with them. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. I don't even want to say that on, on like, you know, the stream. It's just rumors, but no, <laughs> well, Matthew. I can, Matthew well, I can tell you something Matthew, in the heart. In the, in the time of the Harlem Renaissance, these people were sleeping with each other to get their money. The oh, Madam C.J. Walker's, like, Walker's, well, 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 Walker's daughter, Madam C.J. Walker's daughter, yeah, yeah, one yeah. Nine. I mean, that's not normal. Like artists, and I'm not like, dissing Barney. Barney. He's one of the greatest artists of well, well, time. No, I fucking G love Matthew Barney. Yeah. Geo, to be to be fair, remember what happened with Griffith and that old man? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh no. Sometimes you got to do what yeah, you got to do, right? Exactly. Oh no. I <laughs> hey, I'd sleep I'd sleep with a famous old rich woman if that means I would get into the Gladstone Gallery. Um but Alexandra, you got a point? <laughs> Did I? I forget. Sorry. Wait, what are you drawing, Alexandra? Oh, um Is Geo in the doghouse finally? Or oh. 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 Nice. Oh, Look at nice. that. Hold on. Uh, show show it again. We're not going to speak. Show it again. Okay, hi. Here it is. Wow, so that good. is beautiful. Thank nice. you so much. I'll post the finished version um, on the Discord. Excellent. And by the way, I eagerly await the uh, Geo doghouse uh, picture. Oh, you know what I'm... yeah. And by the yeah. way, Adam, if you don't know, to first, and then, if, you don't, yeah. if you don't know, Alexandra comes oh, from the a way. line of famous people. Yeah, I Her do. Grandfather owned what was the uh, Bleaker Bob's. Store? Yeah. Bleaker Bob's in the West Village and in California and in London. Uh, basically, yeah, like he was, he, he kind of, he, he did a lot of stuff, but um, he was a huge tastemaker and cultural sort of uh, catalyst for a lot of music, punk rock, David Bowie, and Frank Zappa. Mm. Frank Zappa was actually my godfather. 
Um, oh! Yeah. Wow. I'm a yeah. huge fan of Mothers of Invention. Well, yeah, I used to sit on my on his lap and stick Q-tips up his nose. Wow. wow do you that. live in New York, wow. Alexandra? I do. Oh, shit. OK, yeah, we should link up on social media. OK. Yeah. Cool. Wait, wait, why Q-tips in his nose? What was going on? I don't know, man. We have to yeah, ask. He, uh, he had to get tested uh, to see if he was positive or negative for Chinese lung herpes. That's how they test. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wait, wait, so you said Frank Zappa, right? Yeah. I want to make sure. So there is this what, whole when conspiracy. When did he die, Frank Zappa? What year was that? He died in like 1996. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And my well, dad was with him. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, I, I am curious if you know this, by the way. Like, there is this whole conspiracy about Laurel Canyon, about how a lot of these uh, countercultural uh, rock figures had uh, yeah. parents in the military. And yeah. How, the CIA, like, um, yeah. like hippie cults, uh, weird yeah. avant garde musicians and artists. Or, or, yeah, or, exactly. or, 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 or very pivotal yeah, figures yeah. always had, like, one degree of separation, at least, of, like, to the military industrial complex. Yeah. Well, there's no Davis. other way to explain Bob Dylan. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Zach Davis and I, Gia, you know Zach, right? He yes, came, yes. He came with me on this show once. I just finished a manuscript last week, so I'm taking a little, uh, taking a little breather. But him and I are planning on co-writing a book that's going to oh, be wow. like a history of the avant-garde and intelligence work. I hope wow. I fucking get recruited. Seriously, I'd be <laughs> such a good agent. Like I know Logo, he, he was going to talk about that with uh, the person I shall not name. Uh, but <laughs> th there is a pretty, <laughs> there is a pretty um, deep history with. I I know like um, if if you could look into, I think we were even talking about this once. How a lot of um, the New York artists in that scene that came right after Urshal Gorky. A lot of yeah. them were basically just like Rosicrucians, and and, yeah. and Europe, Pollock, yeah. they had a yeah, they had like a a weird history with Rosicrucianism in in terms of like the like more Northern European mystery schools. Yeah, kind of. you know so, what else is a uh, one that I oh sorry oh no go on oh uh, another interesting great avant garde writer psyop I think is this is one I want to look into more is Philip K Dick because I saw this. Mm. I mm -hmm. saw this interview with him that he did in France, and it starts off with him talking about how much he loves France. They were the first country to take him seriously as an artist and not just a sci-fi writer. But then he talks about Cointelpro, and he's yeah. like talking about how he used to live in paranoia. But then Cointelpro ended in 1972, and it was like a how, how relieving it was. But I'm thinking to myself. No, they fucking flipped you in 1972 because <laughs> Amazing, all his yeah. books after that were like, like The Man in the High Castle, yeah. like all these like bougie democracy kind of uh, propaganda books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, about like, that, like, the propaganda. That was like Tony Soprano when they flip you, you know, to, to pussy. Um, <laughs> well, 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 it is. When it they is flip you. Well, you know, it, that is a good point how after 72, his, uh, his output started being like, large scale alternate history yep, like exactly. grand sprawling even though like up until 72 like you know philip k dick is one of the few science fiction authors that to this day you could be like nah he kind of called it like that was pretty prophetic yeah. even though that's like a lazy when, when did he do skinner darkly yeah yes yes he did is that after oh fuck oh, oh um, no that uh, that was before he got flipped which is like mm. excellent dude excellent point on the interview of him in france because like if, if memory serves me correctly that was the first time he started explicitly talking about valis right yep yeah yes yep. okay okay well there's another interesting thing with philip k dick i heard that the worlds that he depicts in his books are actual parallel dimensions that yeah. he is privy to experiencing i mean ubik is probably I think Ubik is one of the most amazing surrealist novels ever fucking written. Like, I, I just reread it recently, actually, because, like, I spent the pandemic kind of giving a second read to things that I had read years ago. And I was just absolutely blown away by Ubik reading it again. It's the most sort of, it literally seems to, like, as you're reading it, it's like you're collapsing deeper and deeper, like into a temporal loop. And by the end of the novel, it's like this world, this headspace that you're in is like totally 
separate from the reality that we inhabit otherwise. It's a really interesting way of writing. Mm -hmm. And it's also one of the best, like, I don't know if people were doing ketamine recreationally yet, but Ubik is like yeah. the ketamine novel. <laughs> like and by the way, how I know how I know Man in the High Castle though uh, may be like you were talking about him getting flipped and just writing certain things they would have preferred is because there is no mention of Antarctica or Agartha, and I find that to be very <laughs> sus. <laughs> oh yeah. But uh, what were you saying, Hotep Sophia, before? Um... Oh, I was going to say about the writers um, and the intelligence community. Uh, that's uh, sort of another piece of history that people don't know. But there was um, an event called the Empire Press Union, or there's an organization that was called the Empire Press Union. And basically, Rockefeller went in and he bought essentially all of the newspapers out. And, you know, that's sort of like that organization is one of the precursors to the CIA and, and MI5 and all of that. They they bought, the first thing they did was buy out the newspapers. And so another part of history that people like, I think they get wrong is that you think that what you read even in the newspaper is right because that's how they built the trust. But a lot you have to remember a lot of that stuff was planted too. So you can't read every news, even you can't take every account from the newspaper as being an accurate account of history and what happened either because a lot of the so-called lynchings, they started from the newspaper men. I mean, this came up over and I mean, I'm working on my paper. This is why I keep bringing this stuff up. This is literally what I'm working on is driving me nuts. But this came up over and over and over again, how the newspapers were printing these stories about these, you know, black people doing this and this black man hit on this white woman and this stuff and that happened. And the newspapers were printing this over and over again. And then that's what was causing these riots and these lynchings and all this stuff to happen but the closer you look at it, it it's just like a lot of stuff you have to read and you have to put it through the lens of does this make sense like oh, is this just something oh, that well, sounds well, right well that's a, that 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 has mm. continued to be a proud uh american tradition, tradition yes. where like in a like uh if memory serves me correctly the only newspaper uh, that didn't go with the Iraq has weapons of mass destruction headline was the Chicago Sun. But mm -hmm. everyone from like the LA Times, the New York Times, people with, with that you would presume to have had good heads screwed onto their shoulders, mm -hmm. all now hysterically crying and shitting their pants like neurotic pigs going, well, we, have, even, we, we, we have to invade Iraq. We have yeah, to invade even, Iraq. And, and um, look how that turned out. Like, it's, it's, yeah, it's, New York Times, more like New York Crimes. Well, oh. well, I'm talking well, about something that recently, <clears throat> even, something um, that recently happened. Even the Washington Post, the, the Washington Compost, um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what nice happened, one. um, <laughs> yeah, that's an old one, though. What happened when uh, Valerie Plain Wilson, who was uh, her and her husband were both CIA agents, when she actually went to Iraq, I think, and they discovered that, like, the claims that they were making were total bullshit, they got, <laughs> and I'm sorry for all the libertarians and neocons in the audience, they <laughs> got um, Robert Nozak to actually write these elaborate hit pieces about how her and her husband were swingers and shit like that. Mm. And so wait, she wait, had to, like, is, is, go is that into the lady hiding. Who, is that the lady whose identity was compromised, who was the yes, CIA agent? Yes, because of because the, the glow in the darks basically asked Robert Nozak to write hit pieces about her where it essentially gave up her position. So she had to flee the area and she had to go into hiding even from the American government for like now, five if years. I were, if I were to show this to somebody who may be skepti skeptical what piece of evidence could I give as far there's as... There's a whole was, book it, it about was, it. Well, there it was, was the glow in the dark specifically that wanted her reputation tarnished. Well, th this is like pretty mainstream, like Wikipedia level, like article stuff where they basically like the establishment wanted to get, like they wanted her got, like they put out a burn notice basically and her position was totally compromised. And so it just goes to show that the American government like actually does have a big influence like it's not just the american government but like there's a invested number of interests corporate or otherwise that go into like the stuff that you're hearing every single day i mean that's just a fact but when it comes to specifics there was 
a very good book written about it by I believe um back when like Democracy Now used to like publish actually decent stuff in the early 2000s um there was a book by one of their writers i think even chris had just talked about how like the the government basically like wanted to destroy her um and they used various like neocon puppets in the media to do their bidding mm. and if, well, because like nowadays what you're seeing is the same pattern essentially with people that are out of sight of the norm mm. oh by well, the way Jay, thank I you have... thank you curious oh. carl for subscribing on twitch if you guys don't know we are also live streaming on twitch and on the live i'm going to post both links everybody who is watching this right now subscribe to those as well sorry hold up sophia. Hold up, sophia i was gonna say geo i have a, a historical uh yet current um example of that as well which is the tulsa massacre which just mm. happened the the, the rem remembrance of it just happened um and one of the things that that stuck out to me when i was rereading some of the accounts is that um somehow Everybody found out that this apparently this black guy had hit on this white girl, which may or may not have happened. That's sort of even sketchy. But somehow um, a group of uh, 3000 people, white people showed up all unarmed somehow. But 25 black, they knew the exact number, tw exactly 25 armed black people showed up. That person was like a group of like 500 white people and it was 25 armed black people. Then it was a group of 3,000 white people and 50 armed black people. And the account of the story in the media is this. Some, nobody knows how it happened, but somehow a gun went off. Somehow a gun mysteriously went off and that started the riot. That is the most fantastical uh, explanation of something I have ever they, read. They I was that. like... You gotta be kidding me. Like a gun went off and started a riot, but there was only 50 black people. So why did the 3,000 white people have to riot? And then after the riot, like the next day, houses were still burning. The committee, um, this the the council or whatever of the city met and they said, Okay, well, this was this wasn't our fault. Um we're not going to pay anybody anything. And they already had the developers in there to redevelop the areas that they, mm -hmm. they had burned down in the black area. Oh, man. Like, yeah. this is, wow. It was the it's, next It's kind of like they were uh, doing, like, again, bringing up the Sopranos. It's kind of like the HUD fraud that they were doing. But now oh, it's yeah. like, but yeah. now it's like, get them to riot, like, have, like, a uh, Black Lives Matter <sighs> thing. And then the redevelopers will come in the next day. And like exactly. now that everyone cleared out the area, but but, but that's because we have TV pandemic. now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what the Ottawa Health said in my country. Uh, no, I mean, this, the is real what, pandemic. this is what they did. But if me. you look at all of the riots that happened, they all happened basically the same way. Like the newspaper said, this happened. The people showed up at the court, you know, at the police station to hang somebody allegedly and then all of a sudden you have this riot breaking out like each story when i say they're exactly the same it's exactly the same mo like every single time so much so that i had to say okay this doesn't i, I can't possibly believe this is true because they wouldn't all be the same like mm. they wouldn't all have the same outcomes they, well, they did the same thing follow the same patterns and i mean the exact same that's that's not how humans the British work. did the same thing in north ireland in the 80s where well there was yeah that, i mean there was that one riot where the two police officers got killed because mysteriously a gun went off and the uh, <laughs> literally, and they dragged them out of their cars. And then so you after just that, confirmed my actual theory, which I think yeah. the British started that riot because they wanted to steal all the gold because of yeah, the maybe. whole break oh, bank but, down. But, so you actually just confirmed my. But this my is, but the, this has been. And then what is, happened after? There was a bunch of political repression against the North Irish. But yeah, go go ahead, St. Haynes. Oh, uh, my, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just want to, like, just real quickly. Um, so we got to talk about the topic of the hour. Among other people, like Jello Biafra has been saying over and over again over the decades how he has witnessed cops start riots, how he's witnessed um, whenever they there was. He started riots at his shows when he was part of the Dead yes, Kennedy. Hell, like, not only, <laughs> like no. my God. Not only, not only, Jello Biafra is a. 
Uh, although, uh, but, 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 but here, right, but wait, here, wait, here, wait, let me comment to Alan. <laughs> there was no young black white girl rape that did not happen at all. There's no confirmation that, that actually happened. What they said happened was he talked to the girl. They never even say that she. Yeah, was Yeah, I mean, he had it's probably to the girl. If it that, was a misunderstanding. Oh well, well, I mean, I, well, well, so, so well, what about Jello Biafra? Your oh, oh, Jello so, Biafra sorry, ahead, supported the transracialist to... Elizabeth Warren in the last primary. Right. Well, oh, hey, he? listen, oh, listen, man. And you know what the sad part is? Be cool. Even even yeah. Jello, even even fucking Jello and Henry Rollins bought the whole <laughs> Russia, Russia. I'm in Russia everywhere. I'm in Russia, Russia. Yeah, I can't believe Henry you Rollins talking about the fucking you know Russia. They didn't. You want to why? Because they didn't die oh. heroes. They lived long enough to see themselves become the fucking villain. Well, well that was like so, Dead Kennedys in general, where they were like supporting the CIA, like retweeting yeah, the fucking, all fucking FBI. Anarchoids. So I can't believe just, like anarchoids would support. But but just like, real quickly, <laughs> but just real quickly, real quickly, it has been sort of like an open <laughs> secret that whenever there are protests, demonstrations, or whatever always, there is, uh, mm -hmm. right inside at well, listen, outside agitators in the form of like. And by the way, it's not just uh, it didn't stop a Cointel pro like. Uh, environmental activist groups on the regular get infiltrated by people who fed post IRL. We're like, come on, guys, we gotta go blow up that dam. We gotta go. Well, when Derek Jensen murder. says it, nobody does anything. We have to go murder loggers in their sleep to protect Mother Earth. We have to, and then people get caught up in these things. But the point I wanted to make is riots, okay? In fact, last year, wasn't there footage of like mysterious like bundles of like cinder blocks materializing in cities all across the US? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then, and then yeah. there was footage of that one yeah. dude. There was footage of that one undercover cop in Minneapolis breaking windows with a baton in full gear and yeah. they caught him dead to rights. Like this is this is uh, it, it went from he open so secret. Sloppy. Uh, 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 say that again. I'm sorry. Sorry, he got so sloppy. That I, I, that was unbelievable. Yeah, like, like, right. And and it's it's as if like they they no longer cared about the fine details. They're just punching in and they're doing the equivalent of racking up their quota for monthly tickets. But <laughs> but the same way as like, hey, just gotta, hey, listen, listen. If I don't break twenty windows by Wednesday, my boss is gonna have my ass. Yeah. All right. A very, oh a very different kind of broken windows policy versus the one in the well, This I mean, is exactly what happened in the 90s with the G20 1999. Oh, go ahead, Adam. I was, you know, I'm never surprised about these anarchist types like, like Jello Bioff or diverting to state power. Because I just think of like, like Guy Debord's critique of Bakunin and Spectacle mm -hmm, mm -hmm, can really mm -hmm. just apply to all of that kind of like anarchist mindset. Because I, I think especially with like... Um, like the 2016 thing, if you're an anarchist, you kind of believe more that you should like, people need to share like beliefs, like an innate moral goodness than any sort of just like political economic critique. So if you find out all of a sudden that a bunch of fucking people just hate libs like so much, I think it really fucked them up. And in that case, they're gonna divert to power and to, um, and to the state if the state allegedly shares their sort of urban liberal mm. culture. But how but many people how many people would it Oh, actually I was curious about that book before Geo. What's the name of that book? I want to write it down. Society of the Spectacle? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That, like he, he pointed how um even like in anarchist circles, because this was like the big if I recall, this was like the big disagreement that the situationists had. Um because DeBoard was of the mindset that Anarchism, in some like weird way, has this like thirst for annihilation and power and authoritarianism. They, and author yeah. yeah, there's yeah. like a Duh. latent authoritarianism. Of course, it does. Wow, Alex, you've hung out with some anarch kiddies in your time, so you know <laughs> the personality. I mean, you always hear the story of like usually in these big cities like New York, these anarch kiddies circles. They like have a fucking grad school like book group. And you got the creepy guy who, like, you know, slips roofies in Alex drink. I mean, no, fuck. yeah, <laughs> or someone well, like Alex. Wait, 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 yeah. just to be clear, would they accept ANCAPs or are they strictly? No, no, they don't believe they're real an anarchists. They don't believe yeah. anarcho-capitalism is a thing. Go, go. What did you just say, Adam? Uh, 
Well, it always kind of blows my mind, like um, with the anarchist types that they cite Bakunin, because they're the same people who call everyone racist and fascist, etc. like our aforementioned uh, DJ. But they always, yeah, they, they, yeah. they always cite Bakunin, and no one hated the Jews like more than Bakunin. Like, yeah, he was a straight up anti Semite. So it's just so funny that like wokeness has all sort of these like, I have like a lot historical... of problematic figures. That's yeah, sort yeah, of the yeah. problem with being woke or any sort of like slice of sort of, you know, it, it, the more moralistic you try to be, generally speaking, like the more compromise you have to make. And the more right. likely you are to become a hypocrite. Right. Generally speaking, you try to like. Take but, but do you uh, think yeah, I love that... how you put it like that. Uh, thank yeah, you. but do you two think like being a, uh, being being of the the tribe yourselves? Um, do you think that there will be like this break between like the largely upper class like white slash you know tiny hat activist class. <laughs> I don't want to trick the YouTube algorithm. Um, do you think like there will be like among the like post wasp to Jewish uh, to other like the more people the moneyed class that is taken into this like radical liberal activist mm. world? Well, G Gio, I know you didn't ask me, but being oh, one I, of the well, tribe, I mean, being one of the tribe myself, I have an answer for you. No, I've well, already, I mean all three of you. Sorry, I know, I, mean, I know, but I like, I do, will I there be a split the way there was in the nineties where you had like people within the black community, like people within, for example, the rap and hip hop world that were talking about how these certain people of a certain ethnic group were sort of like exploiting them. Do you think we're going to like see this, like, crazy like a wyatt man cartoon playing out in real life i don't know like it's well Gio, they, all, they the ruled. only thing the only thing i could tell you is i've spoken uh, with people yesterday who are of uh of the tribe and they are very pissed off at all the wokeness that's going on and they want to rebel against it by any means at their disposal so but like but Lev, as, if i were yeah. to put on if i were to put on um a yarmulke yeah, see, I don't want to go down this road because it's really, like, painful. You know what? I if have, I were to put uh... on my white nationalist hat, I would say that um, that's kind of, like, I don't know. But then I can't say that it's specific to your people because I think, like, the intellectual dark web people in general that don't like wokeness, I think they have, like, a sort of, like, weird hypocritical stance about it. They're like, well, well if it's yeah. not affecting me, then it's good. I mean, Well, clearly, well, Lehman, no, no, I well, think, why, is a great think... example. Okay. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Well, like the IDW, there's this great part of, um, I don't know if you've read Zygmunt Bauman's Liquid Modernity, yes, but it's yes. such an important text, especially now. Yeah. And he has a line in there about how like in present political economy, critique is almost compulsory. Like everybody has a critique, like uh, everyone, but the critiques are all kind of designed in a way to fail to grasp the totality of the system. So they all kind of feed back into it. And I think you have the whole Kiet sort of IDW thing. They have these very mild crits, like really what they want is like a version of, a version of our political economy of like 40 years ago. And I hate to break it to these motherfuckers. It's never coming back. This no, shit is I'm not gonna either. rewind itself. No. The predations of techno capital will continue to monopolize, to liquidate social structures, family, gender, etc. And you can throw as many fucking bland critiques as you want. It is not going to stop this shit. And I, but I, I mean, at the end of the day, these people are just trying to have like media. Okay, great example. Well, I disagree with that, Adam. I've spoken with them. I don't think that it's a matter of them just wanting uh, media attention. No, no, I'm not. I'm going to strike that from the record. But I have. Okay, like, okay no, no, no. But no, Go but, ahead, beyond, Adam, but beyond that, hold on. Oh, okay, okay, Adam. No! Finish, okay, Adam, finish your point. Then I'm going to finish my point. Go for it, buddy. <laughs> well, okay. So in the last year, I've noticed like these new sort of uh, art and literary publications that are propping up, that are like claiming to be sort of like edgy or transgressive or antagonistic to ideological orthodoxy in some ways. Like for instance, I just did an essay uh, that was supposed to be for this German magazine about this photographer who just committed murder-suicide and then was like literally memory hold from oh, like- man. 
all of existence. Like they just pretend that he never existed at all. Like Carl Andre style type. Yeah, exactly. But like, it's different because this guy, literally there was like a big outcry of feminists in the art world saying we need to pretend he never existed. And now that's what happens. So they Chris wait, 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 what did he do? I hate that. I hate that. They Chris what did he do to yeah. make them, uh, to, to make them uh, forget about him like that? He what killed did he do? himself and his girlfriend who was a curator. His name oh, was Saul damn. Fletcher and he was a great artist. I didn't even know that the guy was dead till six months after it happened. And I was a fan. So that just shows like how much this guy was memory hold. This, so, this he, new, so he had some men mental problems, or what exactly happened? He was mentally ill. He was schizophrenic. Yeah. And that's another yeah. thing they conveniently leave out of the narrative. Like, Louis Althusser did the same thing, but people at least had the good sense of right and wrong to forgive people when they're sick, right? Now yeah. there's, like, no such... Yeah, so I'm, writ I'm writing about all of this, and this magazine's like, we love your stuff. You're really pushing it. You're so provocative. You're so sick. And then uh, I hand in the essay, three months go by, and then they're like, actually, you know, uh, you sound a little too aggrieved in this, in this essay, and uh, we don't know if we can run it after all. So I'm like, I don't give a shit. I'll just, I'll, I put it out on the sub stack and I get like a thousand more page views than I would anyways. Oh yeah. But it really goes, we're, we're gonna be entering a new zone right now where critique of the hegemony is going to be okay. It's going to be fine to an extent. Yeah. But if you still are someone who's not going to use language like, I know these people are well-meaning, but, or, you know, they want you to like, and I, I, I feel like kind of um, Claire Lehman does this. It's like... Um, well, with mainstream people, has that ever not been the case? Of course. But I think like um, there is like a, a whole new class of like critics coming out that are challenging in certain ways, but still sort of reifying the underlying yeah. beliefs that, that, that keep the whole thing I, 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 can, I can try to explain it's this. It's like this what Bap, Bap calls the fed calves, like the Patrick, <laughs> the, the fucking Adrian oh Vermeule and Pat, Pat well, Pat means well, better, but. Oh no, Gio, I, mean, I could try, I could try to explain this. It's cause you want Claire Lehman on BTR. I know what you're. I know, uh, like. uh, I'll, 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 I'll get, <laughs> oh, I'll get second, Claire Lehman on BTR. One yes. second before yes. you guys, I have to go, uh, I have to go back on baby duty. Oh. Wait, before before you go, we didn't even Hot say anything on, about bug breaking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, I mean, that is actually, everything I say is related to that because especially talking about the Tulsa thing because like that's why one of the the um, things they, they use this whole, you know, naming and shaming and, and literally saying people are doing stuff that they may or may not be doing, that's that's how you discredit someone. And so the whole point of bug breaking is to discredit a person. Um, and sometimes they did it mm. through these like sexual things. And a lot of times they just humiliated them. So imagine how humiliating it is to think I can't even be in a room with a white person because they're going to say that I raped her. Like someone in the chat say, oh, well, did he rape her? Well, no, he didn't rape her. But you guys believe it because look at the FBI crime statistics. All this stuff. It all interlocks together, which is why I like to talk about history, because it literally is the same thing they're doing over and over again. The modern black man is so discredited today. You you don't even want to be around them because you heard they do this. You heard they do that, so on and so forth. And a lot of times it's, like I said, mistaken identity. It's not really a American black. It's an international black which is not the same and it's a lot of mental illness and all this stuff all ties together so um you know i feel bad for um anybody who has to be antagonized by Tariq, but he needs to um be clear on uh the actual history that goes into all of this and maybe stop antagonizing another black person for having a an original thought that's where you get into your your uh your talented tenth and all this stuff. Everything I say it is literally just how the bug breaking works. So if you were paying attention to all my history lessons, you see that, that it all goes hand in hand. And uh, one last thing, Hotep Sophia. We're going to have Wilfred Riley coming in a couple of weeks, and he's an American political scientist, assistant professor of political science at Kentucky State, and uh, he wrote the book Hate Crime Hoax, how the left is selling a fake race war. Mm. And, oh, uh, man. He assembled, uh, Riley assembled. Please put me on that. 
Yeah, I need uh, to talk to him. 409 <laughs> allegedly false or dubious hate crime allegations. Oh, and gosh. he also participated in a regionally televised debate against alt-right personality Jared Taylor. <laughs> yeah! Oh, who? Who? So, oh my wait, god. W- w- wasn't That's Jared amazing. Taylor didn't yeah. Jared Taylor and Tariq Nasheed face what? off in internet blood sports once upon a time? I think they did. They went yeah, they, it was either him or someone I think it was Tariq and Jared Taylor. I have to look it up. That's like Jeez. Uh, oh, oh, Hotep Sophia, I'm very sorry we didn't get a chance to to discuss buck breaking and we don't want to hold you up, but thank you for coming on by. Thank this you so was much. Awesome. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. I always Sophia. love listening to what you have to say, Sophia. Oh, good. I, th- I, I think I you're a true original. Yeah. I try to be fair. As, and, I get, and, I, and, I re- and I really appreciate that. I like anybody who like makes an effort to you know, speak, speak the truth objectively as possible, you know? Which is hard today. It's, really, it's real hard, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. All right, you That's guys. That's really See you later. See you next time. Bye, See you, Sophia. Thank you. See ya. Right. Actually, I have to go soon too. I got to prepare for um, a thing I got with uh, my good well, friend you know Robert what? Stark. We can uh, we can what? make this. I'm going to be Stark. on Stark Truth Radio finally. Oh, yeah. I he been, he's interviewed some giants, man. I can't believe it. Um, and hopefully, uh, I I have to like overcome my laziness and write a few pieces for uh, for Adam Substack. Um, I have to yes. finish this one. I have to finish this one piece on um, on post scarcity. So um, nice. Yes, um, indeed. Was it? What's that? Their name? Post scarcity. Um, the the duo. Post commodity. Sorry. What am I saying? Oh uh, shit! The um, the Native American guys. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. By the I, way, I saw, back- I've seen them do noise music live once. Mm. Mm. Oh yeah. wow! Yeah. What? How do you, How do you think the mouse is going so far? What do you think? You and the mouse. I mean, it's the sickest fucking thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> See, it's why is it? Me, uh... Why is the ears have mouths on them? My God, this is Cause terrible. Because it's, it's all fractal. And again, keep in mind how small of a detail this mouse is in this picture. The mouse is literally just like it's gonna be over here, and this is like the tip of the tongue of this entire artwork. That's just like a huge ass mural, and it, it's getting finished. See over here, I have this duck dragon man. He's a new addition, and he's talking with this moon thing. We got these airplane bird creatures over here, and uh, we got below over here. What do we have? We have Miggy Mouse. So, Alex, what? you've seen Miggy before, right? Miggy. Miggy. You've seen Miggy before, That's right? That's like Dolan Duck edits. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is uh, poor... Gooby, this is poor Miggy Mouse being all disheveled and old and dry, attempting to get on top of oh, the pyramid, man. and he has his lucky wizard hat over here, and then there's also this kind of like Aztec looking bird thing over here, and this other bird creature. So what I'm basically going to do, my master plan is to take all of these and to uh, uh, turn them into separate left cards. Uh, so they're not just for this. This is why I'm making this mouse cat over here uh, a bigger version, because I'm going to have a separate love card out of him, as well as having him in the detail of the picture. That way I kill several birds with one stone. But back to the thing that we were talking about before. The vibe that I get from the people who I've spoken with, let's say more on the clear Lehman side, is that, number one, the audience that they're mainly aiming for are people who are on the liberal left on the fence of the whole woke thing, they are not people who I would qualify as um, accelerationists. They're the opposite of that. They basically want to do whatever they can in their own power to get people who are negatively affected by uh, the woke culture right now some legal help here and there and just general like uh, community community support. It doesn't mean that they're going to be successful or unsuccessful, but all it means is that they're doing a very specific thing, and that's that. That's all yeah. I can say right now. Well, I, I I wasn't speaking contemptuously of what they're doing. I'm just saying there are limitations to that kind of sure. critique, for sure. You Absolutely. know who does it really well? That um, I like Aris Rusinos's journalism mm. a lot. I yeah. feel like you know, in that sphere, he uses a lot of interesting sort of anecdotes and his reporting is is really solid i'll have to i'll have to take a look at him i mean uh yeah i'm not gonna say anything yet we're gonna see there's going to be also by the way on btr in a couple of weeks a um not a reverse debate but a regular debate on the federal reserve 
and we are going to have Gene Epstein coming in for that uh, of the uh, Soho Forum. And we're also going to have someone who I also met, I believe, I mean, fingers crossed, I think that it, it should happen, who was uh, part of the New York uh, Federal Reserve Bank. So he's going to be on the side of the Fed, and uh, we're going to have Gene Epstein against the Fed. So that's going to be a very interesting uh, podcast. You know, these are both... These are both uh, fellas who are pretty esteemed and in it, as opposed to being outside of it. But at the same time, I would love to have people coming in in the panel and uh, voicing their opinions. You guys are all welcome. And uh, I also want to have a reverse debate this week coming up, because we do not have a reverse debate set yet. But I really want to have one either about UBI or about welfare. And Adam, I am not sure whether or not, like, I'm not sure exactly who it is going to be yet. I'm talking with a few people. One of the people who I'm talking with uh, right now is Apex. So, uh, Geo, I think Apex may be able to do it. I'm not sure. But in case Apex cannot do it, and either way, Adam, I would love to have you there. But if Apex cannot do it, would you be interested in vouching for the opposite side when it comes to something uh, like welfare or uh, UBI, depending on which one you would feel stronger towards? Um... I'd have to think about it because I don't know if I'm like virulently against either at this moment in time or like virulently pro either. I'm so mm. fucking ambivalent these days. Like, okay. But, I wonder but if we I, could get like a, someone that is big into the UBI, like a Chapo person. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I, I mean, because that right now, like, I don't know. It feels like, like, obviously, UBI, I don't think is like a long term solution to political economic problems but i also feel like maybe people don't give a fuck and just kind of want it right now yeah. like as things are so well, it, 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 could, it could be more about like a social safety net in general whether it's ubi or whether it's welfare basically the extent of the government providing for that as opposed to more of a uh more of a free market solution to that that i think would be more along the lines of what could possibly uh, work here, unless we want it to just be about uh, UBI. No, yeah, maybe, yeah. yeah, maybe we could have a, a greater, like, we'll see, I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I just don't know what the right name for something like that would be, but finding a libertarian, uh, that's not going to be a problem. As you know, Gia, we have plenty of, <laughs> we have plenty of great libertarians, people that we could bring on. And uh, anyway, I think we're going to be concluding this uh, pretty soon, actually. I was working on this mouse guy, but I am getting kind of hungry. Um, and uh, hold on, we have over here bottled follower 1324 who says, no one wants to work anymore. I mean, that is the other side of the coin, right? Like, if you're giving work all is this money... Meme, in my opinion. Well, <laughs> it, really depends, it really depends on the kind of work. So if work you have work that is, point, that is pointless, I agree with you. I mean, maybe one way of doing this, and some people have harshly critiqued my view here, but maybe it's still possible, where maybe a lot of people can revert back to more of an agrarian economy where people can have, like, a medium plot of land that thanks to, let's say, certain technological advances that they didn't have in the past, it would be easier to grow your own food on it. And so you wouldn't necessarily need to participate as much in the economy for certain things. I don't know if that's something that people would like to do, though. I mean, gardening is not the easiest thing in the world, especially if it's something where you have to have all the ingredients to provide for your family. But what if I do the Gennady stole your off the second approach and say we're going to get drones that will pick up certain pieces of the uh, food or like automated trucks or whatever. Oh, uh, yes. And that way, like uh, you can grow one thing, your neighbor could grow another thing and you guys could just exchange uh, fruits and vegetables and whatnot between you, uh, you know, in a local cluster. Now, and, now, uh, now, make sure, yeah. now make sure if you have multi-purpose uh, farming equipment yeah, drones to disinfect the ones you use to, to accumulate the cat, uh, the cat milk from when you're having it <laughs> pick, uh, you the know, the, 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 the produce oh, no. that we're having in, that you're growing tenderly in the garage. Because, because listen, if someone is allergic to cats, and you use that multi-purpose drone, and and they they, they eat they eat fruit salad, and then their esophagus closes up. That's on you, buddy. All right, you didn't clean the cat drone. 
Well, look, since uh, since you're mentioning this, and I wasn't going to bring it up, but Adam, you are uh, new to the left stream over here, so I want to uh, share this with you right now. So nice. if you are, yes, if you are not aware of this, there was a uh, drawing that I did during the stream called, uh, well, I did a couple here. So I did the Mr. Hands one. You remember this one, Gio, right? Oh, so this man. is my Mr. Hands drawing with the, dr with the cat drone batting a dead horse that's being lifted up by the Salvador Dali like uh, stilts. And there is the uh, the son over here, the child in a kangaroo pouch inside of Mr. Hands, who is looking really nervously at the sentient breasts, which keep in mind, the horse is dead, but the breasts are still alive. And you got the cause eyes. What are the cause? Wait, what the are the cause eyes? The X's oh, yes. for eyeballs. Yes, yes, exactly. But, but uh, above this, uh, since I didn't save it, this is just a screen cap. This is my cat drone idea. So my idea is that you know how people always think, you know what, when my cat's out in the wild, what is it doing? Well, here's an idea. You have a drone that follows the cat in the third-person view, but you also attach these uh, tubes to the cat's nipples so that the drone will milk the cat while it's watching the cat and then this other drone will take the milk and deliver it to you so while you're watching on your television it'll, set it'll be the new health the trend oh my god <laughs> Well, we got we got other weird milk. Might as well have cat milk. I mean, oh, it's... oh well. Speaking yeah. speaking of milk, Alexandria, remember the dream that I told you about uh, last time, where uh, I was. Vaguely. So I was uh, in a far. I was in a barn, and in this barn there was a sexy cow. I oh, mean, God. no, it, it, it was a sexy sounding cow. In fact, uh... Alexandria, can you do your do the, do the moo again? That was a really great moo. Oh, that you my, did God. Last time. <laughs> oh my God! Oh my God! Uh, not on cue. I need to. Be, I need to be in the right kind of headspace. Oh my god! Well, when you when you are in the right headspace, <laughs> Alex is just yeah. making sure Furry's watching right now. Oh, don't, <laughs> don't start jerking it so hard. Local seismologists and geomancers get worried. Yeah, so, so thank Geo, you, Alex. You should have uh... the divining rods, but like Furry's. <laughs> <rods. laughs> <laughs> Deliver me from this nonsense. <laughs> And that cow ended up. Live, you can't into... just keep. You can't like just like unleash cat milk on like fucking. <laughs> yes, you can. You take that back, Geo. <laughs> no, well, this isn't oh cat milk. This God. is this is cow milk. Well, there isn't even any milk involved here, Geo. What this was was this die. cow. This cow came to me, and I petted it on the nose. And then the cow started turning into a humanoid cow, and it attempted to do the splits and. Kind of like me. when you kiss the toad, it turns into a. Prince? Yeah, yeah, but it was still like halfway. It wasn't like fully. It wasn't like a full. It human. was like a chimera. It yeah, was, it was yeah. like yeah, it was like a chimera. It was a chimera cow. Chimera. Yeah. Yeah. And it tried to do splits in front of me, but it only did it like a quarter of the way. Lev, so like I saw. Yes. Lev, what's up? Have, consider your reputation right now. Consider your reputation being ruined by this dream. People <laughs> okay. are gonna know you as somebody who subconsciously wants to fuck cows. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it's it's deeper. It's it's, it's like alpha. People are gonna you know, use that like... against you. It's okay. It's number going one, on the CIA report. Number one, Alexandra. Oh. There, the cow is a symbol of fertility. It is uh -huh, a. Uh, uh -huh, it uh -huh. is an archetype. Yeah, yeah, You, you don't yeah, get yeah. it. You don't well, get and, it. Like in Hinduism, oh, okay. they worship. Yeah, cows. exactly. So, oh, and see, we had bottle followers say Doja Cat Cow. You remember what you said was a dead meme? See, they still remember it. So it's not dead. It's still alive. What's with the whole Doja Cat thing? Isn't she canceled or what? No, she'll on? never be canceled. She's triumphant. She's uncancelable. Uh, she's. You know, I met her once. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, before I, well, I was still struggling along try, uh, before I, you know, became a full-time writer and all that. I was still a lowly artist trying to make it in the big city, and I used to work as a tour guide. And like, when her first single came out, it was towards the end of. My tenure, she had a party at the Museum of Sex where I was a researcher uh, and tour guide. Worst job of, no, I, I shouldn't say anything about I can only imagine. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, she had her party there and she was nice enough, I guess. I didn't really talk to her that much, but she was I polite. Mean, she's a you worked at this, there's a Museum of Sex? Yeah, in New yeah, York City. It sucks yeah, ass. It yeah, sucks. but, you it know, blows. I came on... Uh, I, I came on, they brought me in to do research for the, they did a show for the photographer, Araki, which was sort of fun, I guess. And um, 
and then I don't know, you get you just end up staying at day jobs sometimes when you need the money, but now I don't need it. I'm good. I'm free. Oh, good to know. Fuck it. Man. Yeah. Museum of Sex. I can't, wow. I, I, I can only tell like how creepy this is going to be. Oh, no. In, 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 in all yeah. honesty. Oh, my Alex God. Holy point, shit. Cause, like, Look at the this mu- huge a- like zebra ass in the, the middle the, of the. the is that the, a the fucking mu- slide? The what? museum of. The Museum of Sex is kind of underwhelming, considering, like, mm-hmm. what the title, like, Very it's the Museum of Sex. You're, you're, I mean, like, I was expecting, like, right out the gate, you show up and, like, here's the Crisco Disco, and here's the <laughs> 1970s wing of... Yeah, and no. Here, no. And here I kind of wish I hadn't revealed this fucking shit about myself, but <laughs> now I'm swimming in it. Here is the 70s wing It's a like kitschy, not awful, va- like vaporwave type of. I don't yeah. know. But you yeah, would have liked well. the uh, you would have liked the Iraqi show, which was pretty yeah. cool. But there was a little Me Too scandal that happened too during that one oh, of his man. um one of his models because he fucks like all of his models. Gross. But yeah, so Based one of them. Lucian what one of them claimed while the show like she wanted the her photo taken down and then posted mm. like how abusive he was so it was like it was like that, a whole thing there's like a whole like you know we should we should have a, a could be like on the system systems podcast it could be like a bunch of us like me you julian like we could ha- yeah. have a, a thing about um like uh just how in general um the human body is sort of like this weird like battleground in art. Like for example, Pica- like the way they were canceling like Picasso and Waterhouse, obviously. Yeah. And the way they were even I mean, even Lucian Freud was kind of spared from it a little bit, but like let's yeah. have no Yeah, but the, didn't he like sleep with every model? No, or? he was like he had a I think he slept with both men and women, yeah, but he ultimately was decided that he just wanted to be You know, same thing with, like, Larry Rivers. Larry Rivers Mm. used to do interviews where he was like, sometimes I'm gay. I was gay for a few years, but now I like fucking pussy. And, you know, (laughs) it was like it was like tied into it was it was like very kind of macho sort of thing that they did, which was like, we're so based that we'll fuck men. We don't give a shit. Like Jack Donovan type of. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Mm. um, By the way, I'm trying to do storyboarding of the exact angles I remember seeing in my dream. Oh, so God. I remember seeing this is the snout over here, and this is my hand. I can't, I can't believe this museum snout. of sex, by the way. This is just like... It's so dumb. It's a god-awful nightmare. And this is how I saw... <laughs> by the yeah, way, Gio, 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 this is how I saw the split. This was the exact angle of the leg of this humanoid cow. Uh, this is this is, this oh is the angle god. right here. That's got to be from... Uh, what was that one off cartoon that John Kay did after Ren and Stimpy... Um, cow the and Ripper chicken. Friends? No, he didn't do oh, cow and chicken. Friends. Oh, who did yeah, cow rip- and chicken? I don't know. Somebody else, not not him. Yeah, he did ripping friends, but uh, cow and chick. But wasn't cow and chicken in the same kind of like universe similar style? As Stim- no, yeah. no, no, no. But so, similar style. I think it uh, was um, influenced a lot by uh, Ren and Stimpy. Yeah. A lot of things were during uh, that time. No more though. Animation Twitter. You know, a very very different world and. Animation, it, unfortunately. Yeah, I would, oh, just, well, there's like a Me Too thing with animation, I guess. Like, there's always like left and right, like certain people. Like, I know, like the difference being John K actually pretty much does have a lot of like. Yeah, no, John K is disgusting. Yeah, there's, there's, he's, he's, he's very. It, it, he's, he's quite cancelable, and he's, he's, he's well cancelled. Like, he's. Yeah. Apparently, he's trying to like make a little comeback for himself. There's like some. There's just some, some underground, you know, some whispers going around that he's but then, like, work again. But then, like, the thing is, a lot of, like, the cartoon, like, the cartoonists that had, like, at least some credibility in the art world, like Robert Williams and Robert Crumb, like, Robert of the, Crumb, yeah. the, the the lowbrow. Yeah, it's, like, Crumb is, like, the perennial figure of, like, kind of canceled, but not really. Like, the fact, I think maybe because of his, like, idealistic hippie politics is probably what of course has. and he's married and you know yeah. his wife's really respected too yes, which always yes, like how I, I i always thought it was kind of funny how like crumb kind of memed the woman he wanted like into to his artwork into yeah. reality but w- one one quick thing um uh, i mean that, that's kind of what my boyfriend did my ex-boyfriend oh wow Ooh, really 
is he blamed you into existence well not necessarily me but his ex-wife more specifically but also me oh. you know oh, wow. like okay so I, one of those like selectual pages on instagram got uh, started and it's like making a bunch of memes about me uh. And I don't mind being memed. I don't care. You can have jokes about me, but they mm -hmm. do kind of pry into personal life territory once in a mm. while. And I just fucking don't like that shit at all. Yeah. Well, welcome um, to being famous. <laughs> fuck. But well, it's yeah, kind of sorry. like the, the what price people of don't... fame. <laughs> people want to like... know all about you and the people you have, you, you entertain. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, the like first, like, Crumb's, what people don't talk about, like, Crumb's uh, first wife, um, who, who was also a cartoon artist. Um, uh, she is not, no. Her, his second wife is. Sorry, no, no, no. Not, not his the first one he, wife, yeah, his first wife is the one he had um, a son with who died, actually, a few years ago. Mm. Ooh. Um, yeah, no, and she wasn't a cartoonist. She's just, like, a, she was, like, a mom. Oh, no, no, but who is the one uh, she, like, oh, Maybe she wasn't a cartoon. The second one, the one he's married to now, yeah, is a um, well-respected cartoonist. Yes, but no, she Aileen. was talking. Eileen. Yeah, yeah. What, what were you gonna say, Alex? Uh, what was I gonna say? No, I was gonna say like in the in the documentary, Crumb, like she was talking about how um, when they like met, they were they were like you know she was younger yeah. and um, his first wife, and then like she like Robert Crumb's like artwork like from from just the like details and like the nuances of their bodies was like mm -hmm. very similar to hers and so she was talking about um what it was like being like a not a conventionally attractive woman especially in those days mm -hmm. being like a, a bit overweight but like how like seeing it depicted by your husband at the time your husband or boyfriend or whatever in in the work of art how in some ways it's like in some ways it's therapeutic, but in other ways it's kind of like, I don't want to go as far as to say it's kind of like revenge porn, but it's like a weird, like, I don't know. It, it takes like a lot, like mm. it, it kind of like takes a kind of, I don't know. I mean, when you're depicted in the work of art as a subject, it's like mm -hmm. there's a weird like relationship there. Mm. That's like, well, maybe the it's the universe. Maybe it's the universe working its magic and serendipitously Maybe. connecting the right people together. If you draw a certain thing enough times, if I draw this fucking cow enough times, guess what's gonna happen? Well, to I you? have a friend, like my friend, um, I like I have a friend. He lives in I think Croatia. He like obsessively draws his girlfriend every single day or wife. Or yeah, wife. well, Brad Phillips does that too yeah. with his wife and it's at yeah. a at a certain point it feels like oversharing, like Yeah, it's too... You know, I, I, I feel like the work suffers a little bit of it uh, mm. because of it too, but yeah. um, it's true. I was just thinking like because uh, about, um, I was, I've been thinking about manga a lot because like last night um my friend and I, we went last night, my fiance and some friends, we went to this restaurant downtown. It was like, they cook cannabis into all the food. And mm. I thought it was gonna be like very gimmicky. Like they just put like a tiny bit in there and doesn't actually get you high. But I had like one chicken wing and one fucking garlic knot. And I was so stoned <laughs> that I was like feeling guilty about shit that I had done decades ago or whatever. Oh my like, Lord. <laughs> yeah oh, man. so but like on the way back we had this we were just kind of riffing and i and then i wrote down this manga concept but there's something very powerful about manga and more like transgressive comics like that because mm -hmm. they're targeted at this audience of like very hormonal horny younger teenage men and yeah. and the, like the age that you read something like akira or berserk or whatever it really is designed to just totally rewire how you think about everything yeah. and i True. really like i would love to do like a manga as a side project someday just because i think it's like one of the most powerful aesthetic experiences that manga fans end up like having in their entire lives like you know reading i, I can't think of going to a contemporary art show or even really like reading great literature that affected me as powerfully 
as reading something like Berserk and mm. Transmetropolitan did when I was like 15 years old. It's like a very specific form of a uh, creativity. Like, I think even like the fact, it's really weird how like critics approach it because like at one end we say like, okay, well, up, I mean, up until recently, obviously, but like we would say like Picasso and Waterhouse, like painting someone or, um, Malai painting someone that he slept with his like longtime girlfriend or like Klimt painting like all the aristocratic women he slept with that's yeah. like you know that is like a transcendent act but yet when Robert Crumb does it then we say well it's perverse it's fetish art it's like yeah because it's lowbrow it's like, lowbrow because it, because people, it's lowbrow yeah, yeah exactly because rich people I mean well the thing is Crumb cr original crumbs now sell for millions of dollars oh like, yeah like yeah, a cost of is. like four years at yeah. Harvard you can get an original crumb if it's got like you know some kind of history behind it yeah. um so you know that gives some credence and again it's like that's what part of why he gets a pass Honestly. And he's rep by Zwerner, et cetera. Yeah. And then, um, like, you have critics like, like you know, Robert Hughes and others that link you know, him to an older history. But, you know, ah, this is coming out so good. It's yeah. coming out. Oh, wow. Who is that, that by is the way? Uh, I don't know. It's some model. Oops, back. Oh, That's really go. good. Thank you. You know who flipped? You know, um, Leela Dare did something very interesting with, like, the model or the muse artist relationship mm -hmm. which was that uh he did this one series okay. where this woman she had she was married like a married bourgeois woman and her identity was uh remained encrypted but she had a she saw Leela Dare's series on his mom so she clearly was like fetishizing the whole sort of perverse aspect of his work and like the fact that he's this young young male artist Mm. So what he, she wanted him to photograph her, like with the husband say so in this sort of like bizarre menage a trois sort of scenario. He mm. says to her, um, I won't do this unless it can be for my personal work because I'm too busy to like just do a commission for you. So then like the whole, uh, and then she eventually agrees. So then the whole series, you know, he sort of put the print over like the New York Times uh, front page of the day that he shot the photo to sort of like create like a temporal moment around the image. But it's all about the muse really wanting to be fetishized yeah. by the gaze of the artist. Like, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's that's so I mean, that so happens is the part of like the process, too, is that like, of a course, lot, you know, a lot of non artists want to be immortalized and they want to be part of that artistic True. process. You know, I'm lucky. I feel like I have this talent or whatever. I have I have I have this sort of uh, aptitude for art, so I don't really need to be the subject of anything. I'm very comfortable, mm -hmm. you know, on the other side of the canvas. Um, so I can moralize myself, but I definitely get that sort of drive. I don't know. I think self-portraits are vanity, in my opinion. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, really, like Gio? I, I oh, you I don't do like them, them, Gio? Oh, really? The only one, some oh. of them do them well. Oh, such a some Catholic. Some people do them well. Such a Catholic. But... Yeah, oh, my I know, God. I know, I know. Ugh, vanity is a sin. Ugh. <laughs> we I can't like, honor God, okay. but it's self, okay to... Like, self-portraits are haram. They I are personally wrong. think no. The, the <laughs> self portraits are never the best works every, unless you're truly like every portrait is a self portrait in, in my uh, opinion. yes uh, and no, yes uh, and no. I a, think well, okay. Some of Picasso, like for example, some of Van Gogh and Gauguin's lesser works are their self portraits. Were they uh, doing something else? Egg on Sheila, Sheila's self portraits yeah. are really Sheila's good. different though. Oh, is he? Because he he his type of thing that warranted the self portrait. But, but I think like, okay, I know, but I, I think there's a practicality to a lot of artists getting into self portrait. Yeah, there, like, is, there is, you know, is. like, like Francesca Woodman, for instance, yeah, just use her, like she was 14 true. and she had gotten a camera. She was trying to learn yeah. how to use it. So, but then I think it becomes like an obsession and the, then the, the, the narcissism yeah. of it is a lot of where like the artistic power kind yeah. of resides because like, there isn't, uh, Gary well, Indiana maybe. said this to me once, that every artist not only is a narcissist, but should be a narcissist. Like, <laughs> the artistic mindset yeah. 
has to be one where you think about yourself. It's not, true. Not like overanalyze, like more, it's like a morbid self attention to be an artist, mm. to want to have your work if seen. If you believe that you're already fetishizing and pathologizing being an artist, you can be an artist any fucking way you want to. You don't need to be but an artist. But at the same time, like the language. You don't need like... to be anything. It's just a thing that you do. Yeah. And, and what, right. and what about True. Rembrandt? Think of the uh, self portraits that Rembrandt made all the time. You know, yeah, but those. One of the but see, Rembrandt was justified because it oh, was. Oh, was he? Oh, well, it's he? because he was a straight white man. Um, uh, no, um, it's, be <laughs> um, uh, it's because Rembrandt, <laughs> uh, Rembrandt was different because it was showing sort of the, I like the ideal sort of iconotype of an artist going through life as a young and spry idealist to a uh, like an embittered old man that had lived life and had accumulated. Sort did of he, the market did he plan that whole wisdom. thing though? Like, also, did, remember did, back when they didn't he have very much was conscious of. Well, yeah, that's that's. They didn't. I, I actually think. I actually think to Alex's point about every portrait being a self-portrait. I think there is something to that. Like, just yeah. you know, I just finished writing this this book, which is basically theory fiction or historical fiction. And even though I was referencing biographical information on the writers and artists that I was writing about, I'm still filling it in with my the sort of landscape of my own psyche. It's my own, it's me projecting myself back into a time period that I'm fantasizing about. Yeah. Yeah. So it still does, accept, in a sense, be, it's all me. Like it's not, it, it can't be criticized as like a work of journalism or nonfiction because it, it's it's me pretending that this all happened firsthand because I was there. Right, but I, I think like that that's true, definitely. But when it comes like even like the way that like artists talk about themselves being an artist is to me like. I almost like tune out like there's i don't know there's some mm -hmm. cringe to it like oh, yeah definitely there's a cringe to everything um, come on man of course there's cringe but to I, everything but it's that, just, that was a good biden impression by the way alex what come on come man. on man come on man come on i, I don't there, I, I'm I mean i i actually think it is important though even though it is a little bit cringe for an artist to have like a concept of themselves yeah, as an artist, true. you know, like, but you can't let it become malignant because then you start. Exactly. To exactly. Right, That's the right, jump off. Right, point. Right. When you yeah. start to go into like an elaborate justification of what you're doing, Definitely. when you have no like realization, I think that's when it becomes cringe. But and that's like, so much of the art world now. Oh, fuck. Mm -hmm. you know, what else like, do they it's have? All of it. Yeah, yeah, it's just like you know they make this thing, and then like they're like the curator's like, "Why did you make this?" And it's like, "Oh, because of social justice." Blah, blah 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 blah. You know, they're all the biggest. It's like the most retarded justifications for making anything. It, it's I, like it was literally like this one moment where um, me and Matthew were talking about this one like. I think it was for Frieza. Like they just got like this random art hoe to like go to these galleries in New York. That's a and very so... degrading term. Oh, I thought you took the term back though, Alex. Art no, ho. me, I, <laughs> oh. I, me personally, no. Sorry, I'm very sorry, ahead. Alex. I'm very sorry. I can't believe Alex and I have never come across each other before. Yeah, I know. Yeah, like, well, we have well, a lot to talk I'm about. So well, uh, <laughs> I'm art, so sorry. Art, art hoe is the gamer word of the world. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, anyways, they're getting some random art hoe to go around. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, art graduate, sorry. art graduate. Um, uh, art, art I'm nagging her of right the now. I'm, of, the I'm, of the female persuasion. Yes, I'm. I'm. I'm doing my uh, my mystery uh, slash Rush V negging game. Oh God, uh, of, uh, you're Alexandra. Um. So oh, this is coming out so good, by the way. Oh, it's so good. Oh. Um. But they like. It's just the way that. Um. She, she was going around the bigger like gallery that's in the Rockefeller Plaza and there's like this like stupid fucking VR port feature where you scan the barcode and it's sort of like I mean they've done this before they've even did this in the mid 90s with that one that was in MoMA Osmos where people were like plugged in you get to like interact with the virtual uh, reality interface even Terrence McKenna was talking about this with that, mm. that pig and the Satanist guy Mark Pazzo whatever his name is um, but like you could scan this QR code and then of course they have 
um, the Biggers tapestries that were there um, that were originally from like the uh, 1800s to 1600s period. Um, and so it's just like the way that they were describing it. Like she's reading the placard of like, well, now this is about, and she's got like the Valley girl accent. Mm. Um, this is about the struggles and oppressions of black people in the art world in America going from the Harlem <laughs> Renaissance. It's like, damn, like they, they've got it like the artist selling themselves they've got it down to yeah. like a science of the language itself it's really well what, what really like depresses me is like i just went to this rec this thing at the new museum barrett was with me sierra mm. and nice. uh, my, zach and my friend alex who's an amazing painter and we're just kind of like walking around and the show had like, it was all black artists with like the big BLM justification. But what mm. depresses me is someone like Henry Taylor or um, Terry Adkins. Like these are great artists, mm -hmm. but because of these sort of cultural cuckolding methods <laughs> in which they, they need to, they need to oh like maintain a career Oh they end God. up letting their own work get sucked into the blob of it all. Mm -hmm. And then like their individual work loses the power that it should have as it's sort of liquidated beneath this like propaganda mechanism. And it's like, so like, and here's what I think a lot of people don't understand. Like BLM was ranked the art world power player of the world last year. Mm. And like, it's not about like diversifying the art world because as soon as like any artist steps out of that fucking thing, they lose mm. all the the benefits of it. You know, like yeah. you know, I always think about Darius James, who was a, an incredible novelist who only wrote one book in the '90s because he was canceled so hard, called Negrophobia, which was basically like. A, a challenge of the way that social justice and activism were like not dismantling race as a social structure, but actually like reinforcing it in new ways. And yeah, yeah. it was so brilliant and so transgressive, this book. And who were the ones that made sure he never wrote anything again? It was like Betty Saar and those sorts of like <laughs> artists. Like it wasn't, it wasn't yeah. like a, like, like white curators or uh, publishers. It was like, Artist that should have had his back. Wait, yeah. who is Betty Sar? She's like She's been a sculptor. there for a long time. Yeah, yeah. She was and there it, since like the the sixties. Yeah. And her daughter's really a uh, pretty big artist now, Allison Sar. Yeah, her sculptures were kind of like, um, kind of like the forerunner to what you see like with Kara Walker. Like, there's a lot of like mammy stuff mm -hmm. and a lot. Like, I mean. But then I again, she like, went after Kara Walker too. Yeah, that that's same. right. And that's what drives yeah. me nuts. Like Kara yeah. Walker, these people all were horrible to her. Yeah. And now she is like a part of the same thing. Like she posted the cringiest shit for B Biden Kamala on her Instagram. She <laughs> took up like 12 windows yeah. of her Instagram yeah. to make like a Biden Kamala like Instagram poster. Yeah, hilarious. And it, it's just like insane like no one to stay out of it takes like he monumental effort yeah. monumental effort yeah for sure yeah because i think like the the criticisms it's it's kind of like like i remember when me and matthew this was episode three of style talks we were talking about Kara walker and we were like mentioning the fucking jared taylor Amor before they got the mm -hmm. YouTube channel taken down where like Jared was talking about like the vivacious buttocks and it's like <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny like how a lot of these like historical racial tropes in America just like play out but the like the accusation of like Walker being like um, a total fetish artist which mm -hmm. I mean there is something to it like there's some kind of like weird like it's, I like it though I, I mean I think yeah. all great artists are fetish artists yeah, I mean, I think I, I think I that's think, why Tariq Nasheed is an artist because the buck breaking thing is like this uh, very weird, fetishistic, very incredibly very, very. fetishistic. Like, yeah. but that shit like always interests me at an intellectual level just to see like how 
when you're really like putting yourself on the line like that i mean i know like kara walker comes from money and academia and all that yeah. stuff yeah. but like i, I think with kara that's walker not a, that's not a bad thing yeah, yeah. i've never I mean, believed that thing to be a bad uh, thing ever the thing with uh kara walker is i i kind of do like some of her paintings there's like a mm. you know there's there's a there's a bit of violence in them yeah the cutouts the notons yeah they're... but like everything else now like the discourse around it is so is sort of like strapped. strangle holding and like yeah. it, it, it it creates like a force field of cringe that you just can't even yeah. like see through anymore oh my God. if she <laughs> were to come have... out if she were to come out and totally been like oh what's that oh noise? what is that oh there oh, we go wow. If she were to come out and be like, yeah, it's a fetish art. I love this. Uh, I love my white husband. Like, if she were to do that, that would be like... (laughs) Yeah. Well, she married a Jewish guy, I think. I don't well, there know. is there is also a, a a black lady artist I know who married a white guy, Renee Cox. Geo, as a Catholic, you should know who Renee Cox is. Renee Cox. She did a photo, uh, an art piece where she was Jesus Christ in the Last Supper, and she was naked. Oh my God! That's hot. L- look that up, Renee Cox. Jesus. American Renee Cox, American artist. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. The I Last think... Supper. Oh my God! Yeah, I've heard of this before. Oh my God! You know this woman? No, I don't know her, but uh, she's pretty pretty uh, hot though, right? Like she's yeah, she's, she's pretty. Got her... The yeah. Last Supper was an interesting. Oh my God! Wow, this is. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Let me see this shit. She is yeah. pretty fucking hot, though. I yeah, unfortunately, admit. because of uh, YouTube, we can't, can't show, show it. Yeah, yeah she's but... naked and uh, she's, oh, she's wow. got the, bla- the black disciples yeah. all around her. This could be this could be some like black nationalist stuff. This is yeah. great. This and I think. Uh, I mean, it's Ju- totally blasphemous. I don't condone this, obviously, <laughs> as a Catholic. And, and Giuliani didn't condone it either. He. Um, oh he... yeah, he went after her. That's right. Yeah, and yeah. he went after uh, uh, Piss Christ. Uh, his, no, Serrano. his price was Jesse Helms. Ah, uh, no, no, yeah, no, yeah, it was yeah, just yeah. Serrano. No, he went after the guy, the British artist who uses the shit in his work. Oh, um, I forgot his name from uh, last yeah. podcast. What's his oh, name? Oh, Chris O'Feely. Chris O'Feely. O'Feely, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They were showing yeah. shithead at the he Brooklyn won the Turner Museum. Prize. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When they Wait, still Alec- gave the Turner Prize to people that had created actual <laughs> objects and not yeah. just done libtarded mm. social practices. Yeah, not. Well, Wait, like- Alexandra, Alexandra, did you see? Did you look up that Renee Cox uh, art piece, the I mean, Jesus one? I'm, I'm the clearly one, doing something. I wanted to write. Maybe I could publish it on on uh, System of Syst- or uh, sorry, on safety, the, propaganda. safety propaganda. No, yeah. the System of Systems so of well. Patreon. Um, mm. I. I wanted to write about like the one I got, it must it must be like two years ago now. Um, the one where all four of them got the Turner Prize. Oh, was like it... Co- Code Woe is Shun's thing, right? Like his uh, group that he's in. Oh, no, no. The one, the Cuban, is he Cuban or he's some Latin American? I have to look him up. But he did Turner this Prize great... is crazy. Yeah, the Turner, I mean, it's, it's kind of like discredited itself now. Um, oh, totally. But th- there was the one year where all four of the uh, finalists won. And uh, let me look it up. So this was 20. Oh, yeah, here we go. Lawrence Abu Ham- uh, Hamden. Helen Oscar Hammack, Murillo. And Asia. I wanted to write about his um, migrant refugee series. Because you know. I think like there's a bit of like almost implicit like kind of reactionary type messaging there. Oh, interesting. Yeah. He kind of got lumped in with my enemy, Walter Robinson's, uh, what was it? Uh, what, did, yeah. what What was the phrase he used? Uh, zombie formalism. The zombie formalism, yeah. You know, wait, actually, wait, why would you Why would you have an enemy? Why is he your enemy? Oh, this is a long story. Go ahead, okay. Adam, please tell okay. us. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay, so Walter Robinson used to just troll me constantly. Like before I was really kind of free of art world structures, this guy would troll me over like the most minute shit. Like, you know, he's really just kind of like the art shit lib and yeah. everyone is either a Bolshevik or a fascist, blah, blah, blah. Typically he'll, he used to call me a Bolshevik fascist. Like hyphenated. before you didn't know about Nazbal as a term, but he'll call, he called him that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. basically, yeah. and but then recently, because my career has really like 
gotten much bigger in the last year, like, you know, ironically, after I was sort of disconnected from those art world structures, I wrote a piece about Paul McCarthy, which basically talked about the fascistic tendencies in art world leftism specifically. That was a great piece, by the way. Yeah. I thanks, love that. Man. I, I, when you posted it on Instagram, I, I think I was going to, I was preparing for BTR actually. I just had to like immediately stop what I was doing and just read it. I'm like, bam. Cause like the first paragraph was like, I was hooked. So, yeah. Uh, thanks uh, man. Yeah. The, some of the best stuff I do always just comes like really fast. Like I wrote that thing all down in like a few hours and then took a Isn't few days to way? edit it. That's yeah, the exactly. That's well, the it's, it, it depends with me. I'll usually have one long, long project that I like, focus on excess obsessively but to like yeah. break up my mind i'll bang out fast things just to like yeah. give myself a break Shit, bang yeah exactly <laughs> um but then walter robinson like he saw that a lot of people were like sharing the article like people that he knows like yeah and some people were yeah. yeah yeah and and he like went on my instagram page and he's like talking about uh, the tense is not lining up, ha ha ha, like with this like really shit livy kind of like, uh, like way of speaking. So up talk, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so like lately I'll just like tweet once in a while, like Walter Robinson is gay, <laughs> or like Walter <laughs> Robinson sucks, you know, but uh, enemy's a strong word. I just, I just don't think he's a very nice guy. Uh, and he probably and, isn't. Yeah, yeah, he wrote and he doesn't that. have anything interesting to say. He wrote that one article. I think it was, I want to say it was Juxtapose magazine. I read it back in the I day. I love Juxtapose. He wrote the zombie formalism essay. Yeah, the zombie yeah. formalism. Yeah. Which we know that's what I liked was a part it. of. Now that you guys mentioned Uptalk, I want to do a reverse debate about Uptalk. Bring somebody in who does Uptalk and have him. We'll have, uh, um, we'll, I can do we'll, Uptalk? <laughs> we'll have um, some bread tuber. We'll have yeah. like uh, yeah. Puck Philosophy on. It's not the Chris same if it's own. a woman, though. It has to be a guy. Doing yeah, it's got to be a guy doing it. Yeah. <laughs> but um, that's well, like, like I wonder, like, are they aware that they are talking like that, or is it just no, in the no? Back it's of part of mind? it's part of like the conditioning. It's like the yeah. white voice, you know. It's got the I don't know. It's kind of an unconscious thing after a while. The up talk. Well, but, is um, it similar to like the lisp in a gay society? Like, uh, is the lisp a thing or is that like just a media? Well, not, not lisp, but like a whole, a certain yeah, accent. Yeah, the effeminate type of. Yeah. yeah. Huh, I wonder. Do, I gay, know, gotta... do gay people do that still? I guess they have to. I mean, that's. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious <laughs> if gay dudes lie about their height on Grindr as often as dudes uh, lie Probably. about their height on Tinder. <laughs> I wonder, Probably. do gays have the, we gotta <laughs> we gotta consult some gay men about this. I mean, imagine we having have more like, gay people on the show. I would love that. Gay yes, people. imagine we have Jack on the show. Ow. Well, imagine uh, yes, yes. yes. Imagine Julian. having. Yeah, Julian would be cool to get. Yeah, on, we have yeah. Julian on. Imagine yeah. having like we have the another gay... art stream. We gotta have him <laughs> on. Imagine um, having like the gay version of the bagel boss guy. Do you remember the bagel manlet guy? <laughs> <laughs> nah. Bagel man. <laughs> I, I wonder if gay. I think do gay men look past getting height mogged? I don't know. That's it's it's like one of those things. I mean, well, I mean, I mean, like he, here's the deal. I've had I've heard I've heard enough from women I met on Tinder and even a few on OK Cupid who said, "Oh, thank God you didn't lie about your height." And I get it. Like you know, uh, it, it, it's it's enough of a thing for people to say aloud but then when you start seeing profiles that straight up tell you like please look like your pictures it makes me wonder if there's some sort of fucking like epidemic out there of like i'm sure there is it's, it's like yeah. I, I, i'm i'm five ten to my doctor but i put six feet on twitter and yeah. like but then but but the funny thing is like dudes uh, listen and rightfully so they get roasted for this but if dudes had a way to lie about their height on Tinder the way women can gracefully lie about their age on Tinder, I think we'd be all better off. It's so cute to see, like, oh, actually, I'm 43, not 38. Can you believe that? And it's like, wow, you fucking lied and made it seem okay. Uh, all, it's all this so charming. Shit is like, so charming. Uh, yeah, I mean, and all this shit is so kind of, like, like all this, like, like internet sexual marketization so kind of brain warping because like i mean 
in real life, I'm only I'm only five ten, and yet it's never been. I don't feel like it's ever been a problem dating. And likewise, like if a woman has like a pooch belly or or something, I don't find that unattractive at all. Like, I feel like in real life, like our actual like the, our modes of desire are so much more yeah. complicated yeah. Yeah. than what we're told they are online. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Like, and yeah, and I think a big problem with this is like I don't care if Alex's eyes are kind of weird and threatening. <laughs> ah, see, look, ah! Alex, Alex, you legit mm -hmm. looked like you were about to start hiding fucking knives in his ribs when his back was <laughs> yeah. turned. She looks like she's oh, gonna man. put antifreeze in my drink. I am so I am <laughs> so pissed off we don't uh, I'm so pissed off we don't sense. have the other window to see Alex. What do you mean <laughs> Alex doesn't make sense? <laughs> what are you talking about? What is where is this coming from? Where are, uh, have you ever heard of the term simpaku eyes, Alex? Oh no, that's when you have white all around the iris. I have literally the opposite. <laughs> Oh, it's got the kind of never mind, never. Why? I'm just oh, please, joking. No, extrapolate, please. I was joking, out. I don't. But all, 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 I want oh, to get the joke. She rolled her eyes. I haven't seen. See, eye rolling listen. That far you've come to to Gio's a pickup through. artist lesson about negging. Now she has to. She's playing my game where she wants me to justify. No fucking. I have no fucking clue what you motherfuckers are talking about, and I'm really. I'm like, kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding, Alex. I, I want to know. I know you love me, but I want to know what's wrong with my fucking face. Nothing. Uh, I love I mean, your eyes. I'm you're just very beautiful. Yes. And, and, and listen, Geo is simply carrying out the. Tradition I mean, you're very beautiful. I mean, maybe if you up your foundation game a little bit, then. <laughs> <laughs> Not Jesus. No, listen. Okay, okay, okay. Now, now this is turning into the Billy Bat scene from Goodfellas. Yeah. Gio started out. Geo started out as like breaking Alex's balls, or yeah, in this then it breaking gets Alex's into a shoot. ovaries. Okay, uh, so she's busting Alex's ovaries, and you, you insulted her a little bit. You insulted her, yeah. and now someone is gonna get stabbed. Now he's in hugging and kissing and car. acting like a fucking jerk. <laughs> 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 but, I love but, that scene. But just, but, but real quickly, in, in, in regards to um, Adam, uh, I'm very sorry to, uh, to to beat a dead horse, but what you said about you know, like when you meet someone in person, like you know, a, a number of factors, uh, whether we're conscious of it or not, like the cadence of their voice, their body language, how do they make us feel when how we interact smile. with them, right? And and uh, and, and like, even eye contact, then like. You can gauge so much from that. But now, I have a theory, okay? Like, I believe, unless unless you're Chad Thundercock and you're, like, 6'5 and have abs and a dick that ejaculates money, yeah. unless unless you're that, you're, like, uh. you're most likely you're going to end uh, you're gonna end up in a situation where you match with someone and you're, like, uh, no, no matter what you open up with, you matched with someone and it doesn't go anywhere. And I feel that people, men and women, approach online dating and we're like, instead of getting a match, instead of going, all right, it's like, ah, oh, shit, now it's getting too real for me. And yeah, like, right. people, yeah. people the like. The number of dudes who have unmatched with me on, on Tinder, well, uh, true, but like, guys who will, as soon as like, it's time to like, meet up, either they're catfish or they're just like, playing a weird game with themselves, but they'll just like, unmatch with me. It's very strange. But but, but yeah. I think I think one reason for it is because people end up becoming attracted to the idea of someone rather than someone. Yeah, that's and, true. And even hell, like even even before OK Cupid and Tinder, once upon a time there was the personal section of Craigslist, aka the bathroom wall of the internet. Okay. And even and even meeting uh someone I ended up dating there, like uh, uh from from there of all places, like. Getting a reply from my email, my first thought was like, shit, now it's getting real. And there's this like initial like mental hurdle you have to make, but it ends up getting weird where like on, on Tinder, everyone is posting like their most, like they're trying to put the best version of themselves. And like, I can't even begin to imagine the fucking nightmare women look at when they see Tinder, but like <laughs> a dude, but a dude on Tinder, it's like, hey, Yoga pose on a third world beach. Hey, I'm I'm washing an elephant in northern Thailand. That makes me a better person than you. Ooh, sexy scoliosis pose. Me with a drink. Oh, and then yeah. like you know, an obligatory. Yeah. All cops are bastards. I mean, I called nine one one on the neighbors because they were playing music after midnight really loud. But all cops are bastards. Like <laughs> you end up seeing like 
weird hyper parodies of people. Yeah, you do. And, and, the and, best and, is when, like, I hypocrite or someone on Twitter, they'll, like, screen cap. Oh, He's, like, Tinder boy. Profiles and, and we're going to have so... him on the show, by the way, soon. Mm. Really? Yeah. Well, uh, we wrapping this up, Lev? It's kind of... Um, I don't know. Yes, we are wrapping this up. Let me just finish this pyramid uh, line over here. All right, no. guys, this is the end. This is the end of the left stream, art stream. Be sure to subscribe, as oh, always. I, what, wait, what did you say? No, I'm just, I'm so in love with my, with my, with my painting right now. No, no, she, she's just muttering Isn't under that... her breath. She's muttering under her breath how much she has to pay a guy to swing a, a, a canvas sack of doorknobs at Geo in his sleep. <laughs> no, uh... It's like when, yeah, well... That's yeah. yeah. Oh man! All right, all right, guys. <laughs> we will see you. We, broken. We, oh wait! Before Ooh. before we go. Oh well. It's, you live by the, the sword. Uh, you live by the sword. Uh, you die uh, by the Italian sword. Italian mafia versus the Jewish mafia all over again. Exactly. Uh, New York. <laughs> yeah. By the way, did you? Uh, go, uh, go uh, on. Just, just very quickly, um, uh, ladies and jerks. It was a pleasure to be on the stream with you all. Lev, uh, thanks for having us on, even though. In spite of the technical difficulties, we began cursing technology. We will end cursing technology. Yes. 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 And here is Stain Haynes. Everybody follow Stain Haynes on uh, Twitter. Let's see. It should. There we go. I think it uh, did it update. Hooray. Here we go. And uh, Alexander says, Do svidanya. Wait, who is this Alexander? Is this the Alexander that I know? Это ты или нет? Я не знаю. Ты сейчас смотришь мой стрим. Это... Это ты, с которым я должен был сейчас разговаривать, с которым я завтра буду разговаривать. So, that ah. was for him. Oh. I want to make sure if this is the right Alexander or not. But anyway, besides that, uh, safety propaganda. Adam, what would you like to promote? Um, Take it yes. away. Yes, safetypropaganda.substack.com. I publish myself. I publish my brilliant friends on art, criticism, and philosophy. Also, I have a book coming out early autumn that is going to be a work of theory fiction or historical fiction, specifically dealing with heroin and opiate addiction throughout art and literary history. It's going to be wow. based. Mm. Nice. Oh, I'm also, for... System yeah. of Systems, patreon.com slash system of systems is my podcast. My riffing on there is what eventually leads to the things that I write. Excellent. And of course, uh, the great Giovanni Penichetti. What do you have cooking for us? Um, well, my YouTube channel is always. Uh, I have to get back into writing, uh, but I have to like. There's a bunch of videos I want to do that I have to just like edit or like record for. Um, I'm starting to like do another script for um, Style Talks episode. I think we're gonna. I forget which the the second one's either going to be on. Um, well, you'll see. I don't want to spoil it, but we're because like we want to be a bit more consistent with it. But yeah, um, yeah, and of, uh, hopefully soon I'm going to be on Stark Truth Radio. So excellent, That'd be good. And and uh, Porco Rosso flies again, uh, aka Alexandra, doing the beautiful. Uh, the beautiful uh, artwork today. Would you like to show it to us uh, one last time before we go? Alexandra? Yeah. Hey, would you like to show us the artwork one oh, more time? Sure. Hey, that's pretty badass. Thank you. Wait, wait, hold Fantastic. on. We, we got to see it. Everybody stop speaking except for Alexandra. Yeah. Alexandra? Hi. Sh sh so hold on. A, you get this is a study I just completed. Whoa. Nice. Yeah, what the fuck? Amazing. Yeah. Beautiful. Great. Yeah. All right, so there we go. Ooh. And uh, do you have anything you would like to promote as well? Uh, your Twitter, Poor Caroso flies again. Yeah. Let me uh, let That's me put that in. Now. At again, Porco. Here we go. And uh, I think that this is everybody. Of course, the great Hotep Sophia. Thank you to the great Hotep Sophia for coming in today. And this is a great stream. I really appreciate all of you for being here. Make sure to follow links and follow me on Twitter. Why don't you at mm. Lefpo on Twitter? And there's going to be more things down the road that I'm excited to talk about, but I'm not going to say anything yet because I don't want to spoil it. Anyway, twittercom Lefpo. This is where you have to go. This is the end of the stream. Thank you, everybody, so much. And I bid you a good night. God bless. Take Goodbye. care. Adios. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.